Stargate Book presents Universal Laws, Unlocking the Secrets of the Universe for an Abundant Life by David J. Davidson. Digitally narrated using the voice of Edward Herman. If a man has the capacity, resources, and authority to direct his own life, if he can become the person he desires, or whether he is only a drop in the vast ocean of life, is the key question in today's intellectual landscape. The effects of unemployment, poverty, and need are felt by millions of individuals. Can they get out of it? Can such a split be mended where there are thousands of families divided by marriage? Millions of people lament various sorts of illness and dysfunction. All of this makes us feel as though we are helpless victims of extenuating circumstances. We become fatalists as a result of this belief, rather than being in control of our own destiny and people. A man is already defeated when he succumbs to the sway of a fatalistic belief, thinking that the external conditions are more powerful than his inner strength. In both human biography and the history of the human race, there are numerous examples of men overcoming hardship and dealing with issues in their daily lives. Both anthropology and evolution support the idea that man is ultimately responsible for his characteristics. He has the ability to shape events, and by using this ability, he has produced additional, more crucial events in his ascent. However, other people doubt that we control our circumstances and are more likely to believe that they are the result of hereditary factors, bad luck, the environment, or a variety of other outside factors. They believe that these are the actual causes of our failures. They live with the conviction that we must remain as we are and that there are natural boundaries to existence. They are confident that what must be will be. On the other side, the scientist uncovers for us a marvelous world of power, opportunity, and promise in his pursuit of the secrets of human life. He claims that everything that happens in a man's life is caused by his mind, that personal circumstances are a direct result of his actions, that all of man's actions are a direct outcome of his thoughts, and that we never make a move of any type without first forming an image or a plan in our minds. These strategies or concepts are strong and practical. They are the causes, whether favorable or unfavorable, of the outcomes, which in turn are consistent with their nature. He claims that these concepts generate a ton of energy. We can effectively use these unseen energies, forces, and faculties when we learn to use our thoughts in productive ways. The secret to success in our daily lives is what the scientist teaches us. Man has a marvelous inner universe that, when revealed, empowers him to do, be, and have anything he wants, as long as it is within his own capabilities or those of nature. I think this area is the driving force behind William Shakespeare's status as the greatest playwright in history. Shakespeare recognized something within the individual that was the source of his failure or success, in contrast to the Greek playwrights who, with their famed insight, always saw the causes in some external fate or destiny that led to the demise of their characters. Dear Brutus, we who are inferior to ourselves are at fault, not our stars. Hamlet is seen battling his hesitant, undecided soul. Because of his ambition, Macbeth is tense and driven. Jealousy torments and motivates Othello. The playwright seemed to be saying, you are the master of your circumstance. Employ your power, initiative, and ingenuity and be the master as the characters constantly battled with their inner selves. Make up your own mind about your fate. What is power if every guy has the right and ability to make his own fortune? How do we know it's there? The conditions in our daily lives must be determined by our ideas if all conditions are the outcome of our actions and all acts are the result or fruit of our ideas. A thought or a collection of thoughts is an idea. An idea is a mental picture or image. Every famous realization and creation must have been the result of an idea or mental image. This has been the original plan from the outset. The great architect God is said to have viewed a finished model or idea before it took root in the first book of the Bible. Before it became a reality and assumed the form of a creature, the th th. Creator had already developed a mental image of it. Every plant in the field before it appeared on the ground, and every herb in the field before it sprouted, were all formed by the Lord God. 
no matter if he is planning or building a house, a bridge, an institution, or his own life, every architect and builder adheres to the same design. Like the Creator, every man is his own architect and builder. His works originate inside him before they manifest on the surface. Long before they become agonizing reality, all dread of disease, poverty, and old age are impressions, thoughts, and mental images. The law stipulates that every concept and mental image must manifest in accordance with its species, regardless of how positive or negative the image may be. The type of image we have is not questioned or challenged by the law. We simply understand that we must accept what is given to us or what has already been planted before causing it to manifest. Some men have the ability to picture fantastically successful engineering, but they are unaware that using the same technique, they can get over their illnesses and sadness and experience the health and happiness they so desperately want. Both mental and mechanical engineering are fully dependent on creative intelligence. Like mechanical photography, mental photography captures exactly what is seen. A neglected housewife's portrait will not resemble the winner of a beauty pageant, and a short person will not appear tall in a picture. A black picture can never be white, and similarly, destructive negative thoughts cannot yield constructive, favorable outcomes. When ideas are negative, they also produce negative outcomes. I once met a woman who had all the comforts that affluence might have provided her with to make her happy, including a lovely home in a posh suburban neighborhood. This was a sizable home with lush terraces lining its edges and facing a lovely lake. All around the house, immaculately kept flower gardens were scattered liberally along the paths. Her life was nearly complete, and she had a large number of servants to assist her. Despite her wealth and attractiveness, the woman confided in her friends that she longed for the day when she could live in a hole without worrying about the enormous house or any of her other issues. She wanted a room to herself, one that was just for her, with enough space for her to move around, but no other uses other than to let dust gather and then be cleaned. Several years went by. She received the estate after her spouse passed away. She made a selfless sale of the home. Due to risky investments, the value of her other properties decreased, and she was left with only a meager source of income. He moved in with his sister, who now essentially lives in a hole and has a little room on the third floor, just as he had wished. I don't know if she is happier today than she was before, but I doubt it. I do know one thing, though, and that is that as her consciousness grew smaller and more constrained, she gradually drew herself into the cramped space and deprivation. She unintentionally tapped into the creative force and offered concepts of smallness, privation, and limitation that quickly came to pass. Incorporating these thoughts or mental images into our minds gives us the ability to make them, whether consciously or unintentionally. The idea is worked on throughout the day and night in this creative process. We cannot think about lack, failure, disease, or doubt and expect to experience riches, success, health, and bravery in return. It just cannot be done, just as a photographer cannot enhance the beauty of a shot of a well-known creature. One of Proverbs' saying sums up this creative idea. The quote says, As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The statement may have already been read or heard. It has been discussed and taught by philosophers throughout history. It's possible that you made an effort to disprove the claim in order to erase all unfavorable memories, but you eventually tire of your tenacious and relentless efforts. Then one goes back to the same circumstances and viewpoints, and if anything, things get worse. Others who heard the statement were unimpressed because they did not believe that all of life's conflicts were caused by their own views or by previous thinking that had become crystallized in beliefs. They would rather place the blame elsewhere or on anything else. God is handed a portion of the blame. Others hold the view that everything will finally come to pass in God's timing. Yet this is untrue. When in reality paradise is a condition and state of mind that you may have now and moving forward, these people are planning a paradise that people will be accepted to in the future. In actuality, you can never have anything in the future if you don't acquire it right now. A guy must eventually accept this creative law at some time in his life. There isn't any other option. Whether they are aware of it or not, 
everyone is subject to the law. Perhaps some people also think like this regarding prayer. When they do not find the solution they are looking for, they believe it is God's fault, will, or desire. When their prayers go unanswered, or when they are unable to explain an act of God or nature, they use God as their scapegoat and forgive Him. One of the most often and least understood phrases spoken nowadays is, God, thy will be done. Some people use the concept as a crutch, yet it is actually a potent bridge that allows man to overcome vast chasms and riddles. If God does not hear man's pleas, it is man's fault. If one approaches the creative law in the proper and smart manner, it is always prepared to respond and cannot be avoided. Man receives benefits right away as a result of his ability to connect and comprehend the law. The manifestation is determined by the application of the law of action. For instance, an electrician doesn't sit around and wait for electricity to come. In order to understand how to work with the law that governs electricity, he gains first-hand knowledge of the laws of conduction and transmission. Once one has this information, they can proceed to put up the device that offers the ability to generate and direct power. The camera with the flash may then be operated, along with enormous machineries, heat-generating equipment, and countless other gadgets, by simply flipping a switch. As long as you don't interfere with the mechanics or break the law of energy, you are free to repeat this action as much as you choose. All other sciences, including the study of the mind, operate under the same guiding premise. There is a real and correct approach to think about anything that avoids needless mental energy loss and consistently yields the intended outcomes. All things, events, experiences, and conditions of life are outcomes, as was previously said. However, depending on the level of knowledge acquired and the activity of the mind, each result varies in both quality and quantity. According to conscious guidance and choice, or lack thereof, the quality of results generated by the thinking individual may be good, bad, or indifferent. Some results may be harmonious and positive, while others may be discordant and unfavorable, or there may be a combination of all three. Giving the creative powers of the mind-wise direction is absolutely necessary to produce better and greater outcomes in a certain area of active expression. In fact, it is crucial to work toward understanding the mind and how it functions as well as learning to cultivate and develop those cognitive processes that will help you conquer life and its challenges from the perspectives of utility and common duty. The act of thinking never stops. It is an ongoing creative process that characterizes life. Every hour and day that we live, we are involved in it and make some sort of consequences, keeping a record of the precise outcomes of all our thoughts inside of ourselves. We have the highest privilege of being able to control the shape and quality of our thinking in order to achieve the outcomes we want from experience since we cannot stop thinking. In the course of these lectures, it is explained how to accomplish this in an easy and efficient manner. Our main objective is to encourage the individual to think independently, to build his own strengths, and to start acclimating to his new environment. The apparent truth, which cannot be emphasized enough, is that when we change our thoughts for the better, our lives follow suit. It has been decisively proven by modern psychology that any change in men's lives and affairs must first occur in their minds. Our research has shown that a mind's level of development affects how materialistic it is and how much it confines an individual's perspective of view. Conversely, a mind's level of development also affects how large an individual's point of view is. It does not necessarily follow that someone has a highly developed or evolved mind just because they are wise and have had a lot of experiences and facts. Instead, such a person may be underdeveloped intellectually and would be mostly controlled by lower instincts. True development is lacking when people have narrow minds, limited perspectives, beliefs that are full of prejudice, and materialistic viewpoints. Growth is shown by a wide range of ideas, open-mindedness, and tolerant but firm opinions. The undeveloped or small mind, however, does not have to stay that way. It has the capacity to increase in size over time. The road is uncomplicated and clear. A person is free to develop as many strong and distinct ideas for himself as possible before proceeding to act and think in accordance with them. 
advancement will come as a logical progression. The rule is that the mind is only as good as its ideas. It implies to improve and grow your mind when you expand your mental thoughts and images. You must inevitably get more knowledge if you want to discover the biggest truth. Again, you will be better equipped to manage the affairs of life to use and exploit it the more mental strength you possess. The question becomes, if there is such a law of thought, what is the law's purpose? Some people might believe that because universal mind is impersonal, it lacks aim. Jesus reiterates that the universal mind has clear intentions. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, he continues. So do not be afraid, tiny sheep. Thus, it is clear that the aim of universal mind is for the good of everyone. As a result, our intention must follow suit, knowing that, according to the same principle, what is good for the whole will also be good for the individual's health and pleasure. Everything shall be blessed according to the general law. We become an expression of the universal good when our aim harmonizes or works in concert with it. Utilizing the law is what this is. A force is activated that gives direction to the strength of the mind that has not yet been directed when man's intention is like God's intention and not merely a whim. When we comprehend the law, dealing with it may be as easy as pressing a light switch, just like the electrician. And when we do so, knowledge and understanding fill our minds. Nowadays, the terms cooperation, joint effort, merging forces, and working together as a single unit or as a team are frequently used. We are aware of the benefits of teamwork in athletics and in competition. Our sports teach us that no single stand or performance is reliable. Regarding the game of life, it holds true in the same way. Man cannot compete against himself. He must abide by the law and it is preferable to collaborate than to let it utilize him without his consent. According to someone, the man who has himself as a partner is a fool, but with God the law, he is a majority. Therefore, man will be able to produce an endless stream of good when he is able to unite or direct all of his thoughts, ideas, and wants for good. We observe that the master never took credit for the accomplishments while still referring to him and admiring all the good deeds and wonders he performed. He was aware of the law, and as a result, he was able to use it to execute marvels that left the unenlightened speechless. He declared, The Father law in me does the work, not I. As a result, everything works in the favor of people who love good and uphold the law, not because they are grateful, but because their love contributes to the flow of good. Failure in life comes from choosing to side with the limited things around us. Siding with the law inside of us is the key to all achievement in life. Working with the law therefore entails recognizing it as a silent companion in our thoughts and lives. The myriad advantages all around us become apparent to us as we become aware of the origin and originator of all power. You will never find a fulfilling existence if you strive to grab hold of every concept that comes your way in the hopes that it will act as a shortcut to resolving life's issues. You will also never find happiness if you condemn and attribute your failures and defeats to every misunderstood person or thing. At best, your existence will be varied and altered. Life, with all of its positive qualities, is not something that only a select few people experience. You have to make it yourself. You have to make plans, envision it in your head, and think about it. You must realize that what you seek love, riches, happiness, and success cannot be located, purchased, or borrowed from someone else. You must cultivate it within yourself. No one can provide it to you. Your goals and concepts are sown in the soil of your mind rather than the ground like plant seeds. After sowing the seeds of thinking, nourish, care for, and preserve them until the time of harvest. Then you will amply reap everything that you have sown. Naturally, those with the cleanest and healthiest gardens will produce the most crops. We can learn from this lesson that we possess the capacity to think, and that thinking enables us to generate desires and ideas. We have the tools, including the concepts and mental seeds we sow in the mental soil. Because each of us possesses the omnipotent force of the mind, we are all powerful. When we appropriately apply the law of life, the law of mind, 
everything we could possibly want to have or be is ours simply asking for it. We can use creative thinking to develop our wisdom and strength when faced with a situation that we are unable to handle, are subjugated by, cannot defeat, and cannot dominate. As Dr. John Murray frequently remarked, we exist by our system of ideas. Law of Thought Life appears to be an enigma, a profound complicated riddle, or an incomprehensible difficulty to the typical person. Yet it is actually very simple if you know the secret. All things are mysteries while they are not understood, but when we understand life, it ceases to be mysterious. Mystery is only another word for ignorance. The growth and cultivation of man's innate abilities is the only way he will be able to undertake and overcome the limitless ocean of progress that lies before him. The capacity to control one's thoughts is a key aspect in determining one's growth because the mind is the primary factor and regulates power throughout a person's entire life. In order to control the activity and direction of all of one's strengths, faculties, and powers, the aggregate of which will unavoidably decide numerous specific experiences, and one's own destiny, one should pay attention to the prevalent state of mind. The person's numerous mental attitudes toward objects, occasions, and life in general make up their primary state of mind. If he approaches life with an open mind, optimism, and sincerity, this will reflect in his predominant frame of mind and will demonstrate a highly constructive and progressive inclination. Since practically all of the forces of personality operate in some way through the conscious mind, and since daily mental and physical actions are mainly under the control of the conscious mind, it is evident that one's mental state will affect the course that their powers take. All of his powers will be channeled in constructive channels if his dominant mental state trends upward, that is, is desirable, harmonious, and positive. However, if his mental state tends downward, that is, is discordant and negative, then nearly all of his powers will go in the incorrect direction. It follows that of all the variables that govern a person's life and experience, the state of one's mind most likely has the most impact. Since mental attitudes are the outcome of ideas, and ideas come from viewpoints, pursuing accurate and natural viewpoints will lead to better ideas, which will then influence the current mental state. We have a tendency to believe what we see more often. Some individuals think that the evidence of their senses is the only source of truth, but we must increasingly realize that what we believe shapes what we see. To put it another way, seeing is believing. Instead of moral failings, mental blindness is what causes more losses and failures. Your world will be pretty small if you simply care about your physical requirements. A worm's universe is supposed to be as large as the size of the leaf it lives on. However, frequently it does not live long enough to consume the entire leaf. If a man had to survive solely on his senses, his strongest sense would be sight. This would limit the size of our entire world to what we could currently see. If we accepted several untrue conditions on the basis of our visual evidence, we could. For instance, if you look down at a train track, you will be able to see that the two lines come together at a location at a specific distance. That is untrue. Have you ever strolled by the water and watched a ship sail away into the distance? Our eyes are deceiving us. The ship was not sinking. When you are concerned about a challenge or issue, just remember yourself that it can just be a sensory illusion that cannot possibly be true at all in light of the law. You don't see with your eyes. Did you know that? Your eyes are similar to a pair of windows with a reflector at the rear of each one which in turn creates the image of what you see and establishes a wave current. Along nerves, which are thin wires, this wave current travels. The image is sent to the brain in this way. The memory center in the brain receives the information from here. When we see a familiar image, our memory is able to process it more quickly. However, when we search for a novel image or scene, our memory is not familiar with it and must repeatedly present it to us in order for us to permanently retain it. We therefore perceive with our minds, not our eyes. Thought is a subtle element that, despite being invisible to the human eye, is just as real as electricity, light, heat, water, and even stone, in terms of its power and substance. Our thoughts flow over a large ocean of thinking like electrical currents, tiny beams of light, or melodic waves. 
In less than one second, thoughts can travel from one pole to the other and across the globe multiple times. According to scientists, thought is likened to the speed of light. Our thoughts, according to them, move at a speed of 186,000 miles per second. Our thoughts move 930,000 times more quickly than our voice does. There is no stronger or quicker force or power in the universe as of yet. The fact that the mind is a battery of force larger than any known element has been scientifically established. It is an infinite force. Your capacity for thought is limitless. But only one person in a thousand is capable of being completely conscious of the potential of his own idea. We are merely puppets manipulating it. We shall learn to eliminate our evils and to establish the good in whichever way we choose as we develop our understanding and application of correct thinking. Our ability to think influences how our life will turn out. When one can think, a force that is both near and remote is created, and this power impacts the person who influences what he or she thinks. Our thoughts affect how we feel, and they frequently affect the things we think about. The types of thoughts we remember or frequently think about bring about similar circumstances. When we consider a successful concept, more successful thinking elements will gravitate around it, because like attracts like. There are successful thought currents that are universally attractive to us because they are all around us. We telepathically interact with mindsets that share our perspective, and eventually these mindsets enter our life. As a result, those with a success attitude encourage success. On this, the successful life model is established. The law of mind operates continuously and in both directions. People who harbor negative views about failure or poverty are drawn to these situations, and they will then surround themselves with those who also accept these conditions. On the other side, when we experience success and wealth, we are able to think positively and, consequently, to fully enjoy everything. The world outside manifests what the mind encloses. Some people believe that we must contend with two forces, that is, we must repel evil in order to attract good. This is untrue. For instance, when we are cold, we do not approach heat and cold in the same way to achieve warmth. We start a fire, and when everyone is gathered around it, we appreciate the warmth it provides. Since cold is the absence of heat, it goes away as we work to obtain heat. We must direct all of our attention toward the causes of warmth if we want to feel warm. By focusing on warmth and generating warmth, we avoid the cold. Wealth and poverty are simply two sides of the same coin. They are not two distinct concepts. They are merely a power, even when misused. We cannot focus on affluence and then fret about the obvious negative circumstances. When we consider abundance, the antithesis of abundance, shortage, will vanish. To accomplish our desires, we must focus all of our thoughts on the one thing we want. Our approaches do not play with the two forces. It is not a matter of good versus evil, right versus wrong, prosperity versus poverty. Rather, when we adhere to the law of good and focus on what is good, we should bring about everything that is good. Like rich soil, the power of the mind continuously creates. The difference between a flower's seed and a weed's seed is not recognized by nature. The seeds are created and raised by it. Both utilize the same energy, and the mind is no different. Both good and bad are products of the mind. Which is created depends on your ideas. The binder, a machine that cut and tied grain, was too complex for a farmer who lived in Nebraska and had previously moved from a small farm in Pennsylvania. He was used to hand harvesting and hand tying his grain. He reassured his buddies again and time again. This binder has not got me yet. Every time he climbed into the machine, he was terrified. His horses ran away one day while he was there, and he was tossed into the machine over the coil. Like Joab, he experienced his fears. The anxieties he had unwittingly nurtured and accepted had only taken a few years to materialize. We should be more selective about what we fear and worry about, because our fears may do so much for us. A newspaper once published an interesting piece during the height of the nation's flu epidemic and the plague's tragic toll. Do not fear the flu, it proclaimed in capital letters. It was an article by a local doctor 
outlining how fear was the greatest enemy of humanity and how it tended to weaken one's mental fortitude and make one more prone to illness. People are starting to understand that we do not have to keep every fear we experience in our minds. Whatever we believe in our brains, we must expand. Why do you suppose the farmer goes out to take care of his garden and laboriously pulls every weed? He does this because he is aware that if he does not get rid of the weeds, they would just become worse and choke off his harvest. Knowing that a condition is an effect rather than the actual cause is crucial if it causes us difficulty, such as when a weed needs to be removed. Find out what is causing it by digging deep into your mental cache. There are people who can detect if we can't. Then eliminate the reason by substituting the proper way of thinking. In other words, if it's fear, switch it out for courage. Replace any disease-related thoughts with positive ones. If your mind is constrained, switch to notions of wealth. Force a problem you're having or alter the thought's tendency. The weed-like thoughts will then naturally wither when you replace them, since you cannot grow weeds. We are investing our energy in something as long as we let things appear genuine to us. Whether we like it or not, we are feeding it, nurturing it, keeping it alive, and placing our faith in that thing. As a result, whether we like it or not, it will grow on its own because the law of growth is always at work to generate everything that the seed contains. I recall instances of hazing when I was a college student. We had to get initiated and branded because it was a fraternity-specific requirement. They told my companion to take off his shirt when they arrived. He was wearing a blindfold, and they were about to brand him with the fraternity's letters. They burned him with a burning candle's hot fuse to mark him. It is now well known that a candle's fuse cannot burn. At least it has never burned me. But because of his anxiety and excitement, my boyfriend mistakenly believed that they would brand him with a hot iron on his back. Man can imprint his thoughts on the informed substance and cause the thing he believes he has produced. After we returned to our dorm room, I noticed a perfect letter on his back that looked like he had been burned with a hot iron. My friend was so convinced that he had been burned that the redness on his skin persisted for two days. Man thinks all the time. Thoughts can be altered, but they cannot be stopped. Like the air we breathe, this mental force passes through him and into us. The challenge for man is to focus his mental energy on productive modes of expression. It is a scientific reality that no force can act without having an impact, and that thinking alone constantly has an impact. Everyday life contains evidence of these effects. We cause ourselves grief and confusion when our thoughts are unfocused and flawed. This is a waste of energy. Now, electrical energy may create lightning, a harmful agent, when it is misdirected and uncontrolled. But the same lightning force can be used to improve obedience and serve the greater good. Are we controlled by our thoughts, or do we have any influence over them? This is the first problem in self-development. Are we abusing our minds for our own gain? Are our thoughts causing us to lose money consistently? Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added to you, said Jesus. Additionally, Jesus added, The kingdom is within you. Heaven is an attitude. Heaven is a systematic, disciplined, and productive method of thinking. We must first achieve a disciplined, organized, and productive frame of mind in order to obtain anything. Do you possess mental discipline? What is your primary appetite? Do you feel emotional? Do you express your emotions through impatience, malice, lying, dishonesty, anger, pride, jealousy, and the like? Any of these denials, as previously said, will prevent you from receiving the benefit that was meant for you. Everything in life that rules over us subjugates us to its rules. All of our flaws and shortcomings stem from a certain influence that makes us blind and keeps us from receiving what we would have received naturally if we had been allowed to accept it in the mind. Man has the ability to defeat all of these mistakes and evil powers since he is a creation of nature. That power operates without error. It may be applied correctly to overcome any challenge. Nature has no issues that it cannot resolve or eliminate and all of its movements are controlled by the law of order and discipline. 
If man follows the natural pattern, he can say and act in the same way. Nature, on the other hand, takes chances. There are no ifs, ands, or buts, since its forces must abide by the law. A stone that is thrown into the air returns to the ground. This is mandated by law. Our thoughts are subject to a precise law that governs them. Since the conditions of our lives originate from and are caused by the mind, it is here that we start to control and discipline our thoughts in order to find solutions to our issues. We must learn to regulate our thoughts and take charge of our lives because every issue has a mental component. But is our issue psychological? We'll see. We are aware that riches cannot be attained in a specific location or setting. If so, everyone in one city would be wealthy, while everyone in another city would be impoverished. Wealth does not come from frugality or saving. There are many rich people and many impoverished people. Because there are affluent and poor men in the same business, wealth cannot be attributed to any one industry. Wealth is created by something in man's mind, and that something in man's head is the caliber and nature of his thoughts. Observe nature once more. Every movement is clearly structured, as we can observe. A cut flower quickly withers and dies since its life source has been removed. A dog who jumps off a barn's roof does so with a thud and feels anguish for what it has done. A dog is forewarned by instinct to benefit from nature. Does the ravenous lion charge into the bush in search of prey? Instinct forewarns the lion to remain silent, focus on his prey, and pursue his supper. Have you ever seen how the cat waits patiently for the mouse for hours? These are illustrations of the kind of planned behavior that all animals have as instincts. Man ought to honor this inclination. This is the method that is planned and helpful. A disjointed approach would be harmful and destructive. The same way a lion pursues its prey, man must pursue achievement or any good endeavor. To succeed, a man must improve himself. He must not give up. It is insufficient for him to merely rage or shout his remarks. Fear won't cause birds to fall from trees. Instead, it will probably cause them to take flight. We have control over our ideas when they are arranged. In other words, our thoughts are organized to work as a cohesive whole. In order for each thinking process to proceed in a systematic way, our brains must be kept under control. The effect of every action is a thought. It determines our living conditions. Thus, in order to improve them, we must first make an effort to arrange our ideas. We want to live our lives to the fullest potential, yet we lack the proper cognitive skills. The typical person thinks haphazardly. He lacks a distinct mental pattern that he can use to guide his thinking. Even if he recognizes a pattern, he doesn't focus his daily efforts on it. Most of his thinking is unorganized, chaotic, and out of control. Because they thrive on uncertainty, disappointment and failure are thus ever-present threats. The rule of thinking states that we only attract that which we imagine or produce. Success requires us to think, to work, and to become. We must make some hard efforts in order to advance. We must conform our lives to the law of harmony and order if we want to be happy. We must structure our thinking in a positive way if we are to overcome any constraints. Man doesn't sit at the bottom of a hill and beg the good Lord to carry him up, thinking that he will take his body and carry him up, or give him wings to soar if he wants to climb that hill. His ability to collect his thoughts, decide that he is going to climb the hill, and then actually start climbing is his most natural action. He makes a steady ascent while continuously looking up. He might discover a better route, choose to avoid it, take a few steps back, even trip and fall, and need to pause to recover and gather his strength. But if he maintains his mind on the goal and persists in trying to reach the top, he will finally succeed. A woman was looking to sell her home. She had been praying to her for some time, so she could not comprehend what was taking so long for her to respond. What did you do to cooperate with the law? I questioned her. What did you do yesterday? She had prepared breakfast for her family first, though. She then drove the kids to school. She then claimed that she had read for thirty minutes in silence as usual. After that, 
Mrs. Jones had given her a call, and they had a lengthy conversation, although it was of little significance. It was then time to get lunch ready. After lunch, her neighbor had invited her outside to see the garden, and for more than an hour, the two had stood and chatted across the fence. But what did you do in between? I questioned her. Oh, she remarked, anything that needed to be done. Despite the fact that I was constantly busy, I never enjoyed housework, she said. How did she fall short? She was first of all mentally undisciplined, and less others made her. She ate breakfast and drove the kids to school on time since her husband and the school required it. I remarked, you made no attempt to sell your house. You believed that silence for thirty minutes would suffice. You didn't plan your time or your work. You simply did what you had to. She was controlled by the housework. She had little control over her schedule or tasks. She understood the reality. After she got back home, she mentally planned her day's work. If she spoke with a friend or neighbor, it was only for a specific amount of time and not forever. Her work was scheduled each day so that she could get something done in order to get the house ready to sell. I received a letter from this woman a few weeks later, informing me that the house had sold for a fair price, and adding, You know, I truly enjoy my work now. When the day is ended, I always feel far more accomplished and rarely feel as exhausted as I did earlier. I now impart organized thinking to my children. Do you only complete tasks that are necessary? Do you organize your day such that you achieve a certain task related to your desire or goal? We refer to the first kind of people as inconstant, and the second kind as builders. A vehicle company's president made more than $1.5 million despite only selling 76,000 cars the year prior. What was his secret? He meticulously scheduled the work each day to make his organization more organized and cooperative over time until they operated as a single unit. When questioned, he said that he always made more plans than was necessary to ensure that he would always succeed in his objectives. He was in line with the law of ordered thinking, whether he recognized it or not. If we are having issues, it is often because we cannot manage our thoughts. Nature is orderly and disciplined, thus it doesn't have any issues. Self-control is the ability to direct one's thoughts in a structured manner. To do this, one must start with a clearly defined purpose or goal, think about it continuously rather than just for 30 minutes, plan their day's activities so that they have no time for idle conversation or any other pointless activities, and exercise self-control. We shall be able to advance steadily upward and toward success thanks to this development. Problems will stop being perplexing and secrets will stop being mysteries if everything is in harmony and order. What was invisible will become visible, and what was unknown will become known, as knowledge and understanding take the place of fear and ignorance. Life in its current state is no longer a mystery, but rather a simple explanation of the law of thought. According to our way of thinking, we are what we are. Only that which we think or produce attracts us. I really believe that thoughts are actual objects with bodies, breath, and wings that we send out into the world to produce either positive or negative effects. What we refer to as our secret thought travels to the most remote regions of the planet, leaving both positive and negative impressions in its wake. Thought after thought shapes our future, whether for the better or worse, even while we are unaware of it. The universe is defeated nonetheless. Choose your destiny and wait. For love brings love and hate brings hate. Thought is another term for fate. Law of the Resource Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Matthew 7, 7 Man is never content. Although many people regret this reality, God did not design for man to be content all the time. The nature of his existence is constant growth, advancement, and increase. As a result, when one good is obtained, a desire for an even greater good will emerge, and when a high state is attained, a more glorious condition will be sought after. As a result, the life that progresses is the real life, the life that God meant for man to live. We are all looking for the good in some way, 
because the law of the good is universal. According to science and logic, the universe contains the raw materials for every good that man can conceive of, and as such, he is entitled to an unlimited supply of whatever good he may require or desire. Therefore, we think it is reasonable and decent for man to try to achieve all of his sincere aspirations. The secret of the law is as follows, according to Jesus, Whatever you may desire when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you will receive them. Every person, whether aware of it or not, is subject to this law in one or more of its phases. It operates on every life plane and is ubiquitous. Every day, we attract the things we most want and expect into our lives. Whether there are also positive or negative things, the basic idea remains the same. But in order to more immediately adapt our thinking to the law and achieve more good and fewer terrible things in life, we will need to better grasp the law. We are ensured of the larger advantages of its power's intelligent and deliberate usage in this way. You will acknowledge the truth of our constant assertion that God is our source if you give it some thought and go back to your original source. The main challenge is that it is simpler to look to a creature than to the Creator as the source of your substance. Actually, we don't think that our existence comes from God. We make an effort to believe it to be real, and in theory we may accept it, but there is still some doubt. Some individuals find it difficult to believe in something they cannot see. Putting our faith in what we see is considerably simpler. Now that we can see, many of us are ready to accept it and delight in it. However, we shall see it and appreciate it later when we are prepared to believe in the abundance of good. So, the initial query is, which comes first, seeing or believing? The law is dependent on our believing which in turn dictates our seeing, and as we examine the facts, we will discover that the latter comes first. Magic was once believed in. They used to think that material objects might just emerge. They also thought that things could vanish into thin air. Science has long refuted this notion and demonstrated the impossibility of magic, with the exception of instances in which it is performed via a chemical trick, a deceptive maneuver, or an optical illusion. Nothing can ever change into anything, and nothing can ever change into nothing. There are countless ways in which substance can be altered, but it can never be eliminated. For instance, an acorn planted in the ground will grow into a tree. The tree will always produce leaves in the spring and drop them in the autumn. The leaves will eventually fall to the ground and mix with the rich soil. After a hundred years, the tree dies, falls to the ground, and begins to degrade. This decayed wood gradually assimilates into the earth and hardens into peat and charcoal. To use as fuel in the home, the charcoal is dug and hauled in. Here it is set ablaze and reduced to ashes. The heat produced is then used to heat the home. The ashes are once more dumped into the ground, feeding the soil, which in time feeds another seed, causing it to sprout and eventually grow into a sizable tree. After a tree's life cycle, we observe that it changes shape numerous times. We also observe the emission of gases, heat units, and chemicals of all sorts, but if precise measurement were feasible, we would have discovered that a significant portion has been lost. Since nothing can ever be lost or wasted, every resource that has ever existed is still in existence now. There is never going to be a lack of resources. Some people's failure to see and appreciate the plenty around them is evidence that they do not comprehend or adhere to the law. They claim that there is no abundance because they are blind, and from what they can tell, that may be the case. However, kids will understand otherwise once they learn to visualize. Every aspect of life is subject to the law's supply and demand phase. When he created the first electric light, Thomas Edison used it decades ago. Did the populace accept his carbon lamp when it was presented to them as a brand new form of illumination that was vastly better to any technique at the time? Many others thought it was absurd and overpriced. They were utilizing oil lamps, candles, and just a few gas lights. Such lighting was excellent. As a result, it took some time for the general population to become aware of the benefits of electricity over the outdated system of light, heat, and power. Before people were persuaded of the benefits of this new approach of constructing strong dwellings, 
putting poles and cables across the city with factories and houses, people did not invest in the future. How was all of this done? Electricity was required whenever there was a demand for it. What source did it all have? A small amount from the ground, the air, the water, the steam, the gas, the oil, and thousands of other sources. Nature, whose foresight produced these components in the earth, is where it originates. Once upon a time, our ancestors traveled by horseback, carriage, or stagecoach. Not so long ago, having a herd of horses and a carriage made one a household name in the city. Now, where are they? They have all but been forgotten. They have been replaced by the car. How is this possible? Man developed an idea when people desired a way to travel that was faster, more comfortable, and more opulent. He considered creating a carriage without horses. He worked on a strategy, gradually improved it, rectified it, and gradually won people over to the idea of using contemporary transportation. A remarkable man started creating an automobile that the common man could buy after having a dream about the entire world being on wheels. Today, the vehicle has taken on such a significant role in modern man's existence that we often wonder how he ever managed to advance without it. You know, ideas have always come to man whenever he has needed anything in life. The transformation of a chunk of mud or metal into a usable form served as inspiration for him to develop the concept and then to make it a reality. Why did people stick with the horse and carriage for so long, yet not be able to love the automobile? since they were unable to imagine it. Their brains weren't programmed to make such requests. Was the necessary equipment on hand to create such a car? Both then and now, there were a lot of materials available. In fact, they had been available from the beginning. Therefore, God was not to blame for the car arriving to the man who needed it so late. Man was to blame, since it took him so long to realize that necessity. There won't be any indication of a resource where there is demand. Before they were able to expand their thoughts to the extent of envisioning the necessity for the vehicle, our parents who had a horse and consciousness in its infancy were unable to imagine a new form of transportation. One's consciousness has the key to understanding the law. The quality of a man's life is not determined by the quantity of his possessions, but rather by his awareness of them. Man has access to the entirety of the world's wealth, but he can only fully appreciate it to the extent that his conscience permits him to do so. I once read about a man who operated a small farm and dairy south of Pittsburgh. He labored arduously day in and day out to provide himself and his family with a modest living. Some men once crossed his meadow after buying some nearby acreage. The farmer observed that they stopped, knelt down, and looked at the slime and scum he had gathered on the footbridge as they passed by a stream that cut through the field. One individual appeared to swallow the water after taking it in his hand. Another person filled a dish he carried with water that was fastened to a belt buckle. The cattle did not like it too, pushing the scum aside to drink the water, and the farmer was perplexed as to why anyone would be interested in the item. A stranger called him a few weeks later and made him an incredible offer for the land. Why? He concluded that the man must be a stupid. Even if he had worked for years, his company could never have made that much. He instantly sold the farm because he was overjoyed at the thought of having that much money. To be close to his brother, he relocated to Canada and acquired a second farm. However, it didn't take long before machinery was set up on the land he had sold, and rumors of an oil discovery spread. The owners of the farm, which had fewer than 100 acres, received millions of dollars in oil over a short period of time. Because he only knew how to scrape the surface and cultivate the soil, the farmer continued to be impoverished and labored hard. Man had access to an abundance of things offered by nature, but it was limited. The farm was all he could see, a vast expanse of mud and rocks. The fact that man was struggling to make ends meet and had to labor hard was not the law's fault. Man will live in poverty as long as he sees life exclusively as a struggle, a burden, an inconvenience, and a limitation. Worrying about resources or where we will get our next dollar is something we dare not do. 
Worry and anxiety can limit our options and our access to resources. Whether the drug flow is modest or huge, they frequently stop it. They confine it rather than expanding it. Rather than enhancing our circumstance or expanding our resource, they push us more into uncertainty and anxiety. We don't wait any longer. Instead, we stiffen up and worry, which heightens our fear and saps our energy. We need to unwind and be more open, as opposed to amplification of our thinking. To expand our thinking, we must educate our minds. When we believe we can get more abundance, we actually do. This does not imply that the farmer will remain in poverty and the engineer will become wealthy. There are both wealthy farmers and poor engineers. Wealth is determined by the demands we place on our careers, not by the vocation itself. We not only broaden our thinking, but also receive more abundantly when we are able to think and realize more abundance than we now have. This is the fundamental tenet of the law. The magnet cannot be charged by itself. A person familiar with the process is required. In the hands of a novice, a magnet would not alter much, but in the hands of an expert mechanic, it could become a powerful force of attraction and accomplish incredible things. Similar to this, if assistance can be received from someone who has a thorough understanding of the law and can give him a good start, a person's magnet mind can be activated by a significant force of attraction. Positive thoughts can certainly be charged into the magnet mind, but it will take some time for them to take effect, and a pupil who gives up quickly will feel demoralized before the task is completed. I've always believed that it is preferable to start off strong and receive assistance whenever feasible, rather than making the road to self-education slower and more difficult. Knowing that the legislation is effective will enable the student to advance quickly in his development and with practice. Any awareness of poverty, whether it be widespread or personal, is the root cause of all global poverty. Why do millions of people in India experience poverty and millions more perish from famine each year? Many of them, so I've been told, have never in their life eaten a complete meal. There is no way that nature could have overlooked the necessity for such a big population. No way is it because there isn't enough food available. It's because people's perspectives have been restricted to such destitution. Inquire about the farmer's harvest. He will tell you that the overstock, not the lack, is his issue. Regardless of whether he works in gold, silver, diamond, coal, or iron mines, ask the miner, and he will tell you that supply is significantly outpacing demand. The scientist will confirm that there is plenty of food if you ask him. There isn't any more food available than what we can eat. More power exists in a single drop of water or a single lump of sugar than man is currently aware of. Supply outweighs demand, and human thought processes dictate demand. Most of us believe that our ability to attract is insufficient to meet the expectations. Our minds are like magnets that draw other people who are kind and pleasant to themselves. The amount of magnetism that a magnet generates or accumulates inside itself determines how much matter it can draw to itself. Because of our anxieties and fears, our mental magnet is significantly decreased and our good flowing influx is gradually decreasing. If our mental fortitude wanes too much, we might also turn back the good that is coming our way. Similar to how electrical energy may be used to increase a magnet's magnetic strength, mental energy can be used to increase the strength of attraction in our minds. We must abide by a natural law much like nature. Nature constructs upward rather than below. Like nature, we cannot use magic or work miracles to receive riches. We cannot suddenly acquire wealth, good health, or pleasure. Nature demonstrates how we can make use of everything or only a portion of the available substance. Our thoughts are the substance at hand, and they fill our minds with uplifting ideas. To be realized, our pleasant ideas must always be directed upward and towards something positive, just like in nature. Does Mother Nature disagree and locate the particular bee a job that is only part-time if, for instance, a bee in a hive has decided to burden its fellow bees and do only half the work? She doesn't, in fact. She tells the other bees to send their own warriors to the bee, who is hard at work gathering honey and filling the hive. She is graciously dismissed and fatally stung. 
a lethargic bee is destroyed by nature. If, like nature, an idea enters our minds when it is not yet strong or fully positive, we must observe the law and eliminate it. We must not attempt to suppress a partial truth or a lazy idea without compromising our ability to attract and accept others. Right now is the ideal moment to begin an inventory. Law should carefully sort through our thoughts to separate the good from the bad. One must find the stray ones, kill them, and refuse to tolerate them ever again. Then, one must vigilantly guard each idea to prevent another weak thought from sneaking in and destroying those who are attempting to do good. One day in the fall, a man approached me and shared his worries about his job. He spent several years working in a hotel where I first noticed the impact of a slow season. He claimed that it was about to shut down and send staff members home till spring. I think these people are aware that there will be a lockout because they are in the manager's office, he stated. What can I do about it, in your opinion? I answered, There is just one thing you can do. Return to your work and put the law into effect. If the resource and the position are determined by the law, then only the law can alter for you. Realizing this and keeping it in mind will make it easier for you to witness the law in action. There will be an open door before this one can close if the law has another position for you. Ignore the rumors and return to your work. Allow them to feel frightened and hurried, but resist letting your own fear take control. Get ready to add another year to your records in order to demonstrate your confidence or trust in the law. Expect the work to increase and get better as you move forward. He returned and followed the instructions. He strongly considered the rise in effort and activity when the rumors materialized. As a result, he was kept during difficult times. He was kept in the office to run the company, and he received a pay hike as a result of the added workload and responsibilities. If he had persisted in suppressing his worries and concerns about missing and losing his job, he would have suffered similarly to those who had been fired. This is in accordance with the law, which respects people. He would have lost his mental magnet if he had allowed his thoughts of goodness to turn to thoughts of deprivation. More than his imagination could hold, he would not have been able to draw. No matter how much or how fervently we pray, it is only when we follow the law that our petitions are answered. The amount of benefit we receive from the law will determine how well it serves us. In one of his writings, Robert Collier describes an incident that took place in Chicago. The inquiry, what is your religion, was posed to a young man in the elevator of a major corporation. To the surprise of others, he responded right away that his religion was Sears, Roebuck & Company. Today, same young man works as an executive for the same business. Why? He applied the rule of demand while just considering himself. His success was based on the success of his business. His overlapping interests allowed him to join the business. He now has a great office, his own office, and various salaries. Your religion is the same if your need is the resource. Your only thought must be abundance, just as the young man's. When resources and abundance are one, you must apply the law to ensure that you consider resources in all of your conversations and daily activities. Keep your mind so occupied with thoughts of abundance that any stray concepts of scarcity or loss will be banished. Do not mistake resources with money. One of many available resources is money. The love of money is the source of evil, not money itself. You push the law away from every other good if you only think about money and use every available tool to acquire it. You will only obtain a small portion if you concentrate on a component rather than the total. You will like all the components if you keep your attention on the total. If you only use the law to amass wealth because you love money, you can get wealth. But you will also have to lose a lot more, since your life will be very lonely and void. I once knew a man who made it his life's mission to prioritize wealth accumulation. He accomplished his goal and rose to prominence in his city. Before he passed away, he said to a friend, I did everything I could to get rich. I earned riches, but I lost my wife's affection and company, as well as the satisfaction of being our children's father. I lost my health, and I'm trying to get it back by spending all of my money.
but it's not working. Although I did learn how to get money, I never learned how to live. We will be able to satisfy every need if we love the law. Use the law as a resource and apply it wisely. There will be no loss if we learn to live a healthy, free, and smart life. Our lives shall be fully realized as God, the law, intended. There may be a large number of people who are attempting to adhere to ideals of truth and who have serious words and thoughts regarding the resource, but it seems to arrive in very little or no form. This could be largely attributed to the fact that the senses are still too powerful for the mind to govern. Before one may believe, one must first see. That is, despite your assertions, you actually believe more in what you see than what you are trying to imagine, because you are so used to seeing so much wealth and resources. You must first develop your senses in order to be able to manage the ideas that you are aware you must have in order to follow the law. A crystal clear illustration of this is given by Florence Shin in her book, The Game of Life. She describes a man who was looking for work and contemplating whether to buy a new coat with his limited funds or save them in case he needed to find employment. It was a pricey for a coat that he was encouraged to purchase. This significantly decreased his financial account, but it greatly increased his trust and self-assurance to the point where his future employer was moved by his spirit and offered him a fantastic job. The law met the requirement since the coat let him feel affluent and the business gave him more boldness and confidence. It is wise to do actions that will make it simpler for the individual to see some prosperity if such a scenario arises in which it feels better to have some evidence of prosperity. Working for success is undoubtedly counterproductive if you have a mountain of debt, restrictive circumstances, or squalor all around you. It is better to leave such a viewpoint and go elsewhere where the viewpoint is more in line with what the mind desires. I make an effort to be in a setting that is abundant with beauty, and where the people around me are not constrained when I want to work for success for myself or others. Therefore, since it is God's will for you to enjoy all that will bring you enjoyment and advancement, you can constantly draw all types of good into your life. Expecting good is asking for good, and every desire is an expression of will because both are required to draw in the resource. In order for all good to result from your goal, you must endeavor to align it with God's purpose and the law. Every man, woman, and kid is endowed by nature with an abundance of every essential good. This is an important fact. Living in poverty when there is plenty for everyone is wrong. When peace can reign, it is wrong for a member of the human family to amass enormous wealth at the expense of his fellow beings. It is also wrong for the powerful to exploit the weak, and it is wrong to be denied a good of any kind that might be necessary to advance a person's well-being and happiness. Therefore, anything that prevents fulfillment, harmony, progress, and expansion is abnormal. In order for man to live in closer harmony with the fundamental law of the resource, nature originally intended that his genuine needs, not the urges that arise, but rather his typical precise needs, must be abundantly supplied. Nature is a generous giver of blessings, creating abundantly and always for the benefit of mankind. As a result, everyone has an inherent right to access to all the goods they can use or enjoy. Man, however, has forgotten the underlying reality on which this instruction is based, since he has been trained to use and depend on his resources. Let's first acknowledge that the world of effects in which we live is a sphere behind which a world of causes exists. As a result, we understand that when we seek a certain effect, it is because that particular good is already there in the realm of causes. Then we understand that our desire for a specific consequence is a component of an underlying cause. Our understanding of the rule of demand is founded on this idea, and if you learn how to put it to work effectively, you will be able to bring more and more good into your life, in whatever form you may require or desire. There is an omnipotent principle of good that pervades the entire planet. It affects us in various ways. Every positive idea serves as a seed for future positive outcomes. Everyone has the right to appropriate and make use of good, and the more good we comprehend and appreciate, the closer our lives are to the intentions of this ever-present spirit of good. There is no end to the good that can be generated and experienced in your life when you discover how to tap the source of the resource for all. In actuality, in order for him to flourish and develop in an organized manner, Man embodies every natural law. 
Therefore, he is not apart from any good that would be required for him to increase his happiness or advance in his development. However, how he makes use of his current knowledge and power endowment will primarily determine whether he lacks or has what he needs or requires. Man will accomplish more good in the sphere of his expression, in his own tiny universe, as he develops in genuine understanding and makes more effective use of his abilities. Law of Attraction The two key phases of the underlying law guiding the resource in the domain of consequences are desire and expectation. The first mental attitude is the law's positive phase, and the second is the law's negative phase, both indicate enticing lines of force that must be followed for best outcomes. The initial stage of desire encompasses a favorable process of attraction. That is, when someone fervently seeks something, a line of force connecting him to the intangible side of the desired good is established. If he loses strength or changes his desire, that particular line of force breaks off or misses its mark. Nevertheless, if he maintains his want or ambition for the necessary good, it will eventually be accomplished, in part or in full. The underlying idea is that one cannot covet something that already exists until it exists in form, at which point it exists in substance. Desire is the ability to make something visible or have a physical effect. Without expecting to receive it, in whole or in part, a desire is pointless. A wish or a dream without expectations is meaningless. Simply put, doing so wastes a great deal of mental energy. As a result, constant expectation is required for it to materialize in your life. Desire will connect you with the inner world of causes and allow you to invisibly connect with the substance of what you desire. Expectation is a force of mental design operating in the invisible domain, similar to the gravitational force in the physical world. Everyone is aware that many people aspire to nice things they will never own or will never put out the necessary effort to obtain. They get off to a good start and might even make it halfway before giving up. Most of their dreams or wishes will gradually come true after they learn to recognize the other half of the process at play and to expect what they want. Once more, we see folks who frequently expect the things they do not want to happen. This demonstrates how strong an attraction expectation is. Avoid wanting what you don't expect and refraining from expecting something you don't want. You attract the unfavorable when you expect something you don't want, and you merely waste precious mental energy when you desire what you don't expect. On the other side, your power to attract anything becomes compelling when you expect what you continuously crave. Expectation brings the desired thing into your life, while desire links you with it. The law is this. If you are suffering from any kind of oppression, including poverty, difficulty, limitations, or deprivation, start thinking about this law of mind right away. Over time, you will gradually become more adept at using it to create better things and circumstances. Your right to happiness is an unalienable one. In order to better understand the tremendous latent possibilities within ourselves and the unseen laws that the mind produces, we should endeavor to study more. Nature does not deprive us of anything nice or desirable. Rather, she has given us the mental capacity and inner strength to get and appreciate every good that is necessary for a happy and fruitful existence. The ability to apply knowledge is the true test of its usefulness, since knowledge that cannot be put to use practically is of little or no value. Here is a straightforward approach to using the law of attraction to our life in order to enhance the amount of good. Create an accurate mental picture of what you want. Wish for a tremendous deal of good in that direction, but don't specify how it will happen or what form it will take. Avoid being tense or experiencing any stress or worry. It is better to mentally recreate the scene at random times when you are relaxed and unhurried. Allow yourself to visualize the concept or project as if it were a moving image on a screen. Avoid pressing the concept because it will just lead to congestion and muddle. The outcomes will be better the more composed and silent you are. Maintaining this idea is crucial. Therefore, keep sating your hunger or want while maintaining a tranquil, assured trust that what you seek will manifest. As long as you maintain this attitude, the desired good will draw itself toward you. Depending on the clarity and force of the demand 
and the specific type of good requested, it may occur practically instantly in the case of simple items like an invitation, a book, or running into a buddy on the street, or it may come later. Be sensible and practical in the interim, and do what you can to encourage his arrival. I don't have much faith that the Lord will answer individuals who sit impatiently in a chair for their desired outcome to fall into their laps. It is written somewhere, Help yourself, and God will help you. Yes, taking action yields results. This supports the creative thought process and gives it a means of expression. The outcomes are then left up to the law. The law will be put to rest if you do your part. The length of time it appears to take to produce your resource will depend on how well or completely you cooperate with the legislation. Time is a construct of man. Nature has no concept of time and always acts in the here and now. Sometimes the outcomes you get will appear nearly supernatural. When there has been a profound desire for a certain benefit without anticipating its fulfillment, adding action will frequently lead to happier outcomes in the end. In actuality, when you combine the two fundamental components of desire and expectation, you are always in compliance with the law. A secret intelligence is activated, connecting you to the actual strategies for realizing your goals. The underlying principle of this attraction mechanism is as clear-cut and demonstrable as any mathematical science principle. We all use it on a daily basis in some capacity, albeit typically unintentionally and hence imperfectly, in order to avoid depriving someone else of something they are entitled to. Avoid wanting or demanding it. Only desire things that will make your life more complete, happier, and allow you to assist others in a better and happier state. Use the wisdom God has given you to distinguish between reasonable and irrational requests and try to be reasonable in your demands. Your innermost self yearns for abundance, satisfaction, and harmony. When you follow the rule, continually hope for a growth in good as proof of your faith, gain wisdom and trust in the great source of all good, you gradually come to possess these conditions more and more in your life. Everything that matches the condition of the mind at any given time is drawn to it like a magnet. Whatever you visualize in your head, anticipate and think about tends to attract things and circumstances that are harmonious with it. The law of mental attraction's reality and ongoing functioning have been amply supported by science. Everyone should therefore use extra caution in how and what they think. The earlier we acknowledge that most of what happens in our lives is a direct result of our predominant mental attitude, the sooner we may start to change and advance in our lives. To give the law a chance to assist us, we must endeavor to instill it with the will to advance. Then, everything functions to assist us. Obstacles will increase our resolve to prevail. Other people's discouragement will simply make things stronger and spark more activity. We will comprehend and see more clearly how every challenge is an opportunity for growth and every challenge is a step on the road to success. Because the spirit within us is unbreakable and is always summoned by desire and aspiration, it always has greater power and is richer in wisdom. Our so-called weights will lose their heaviness. This will direct our thoughts and deeds in the direction of the avenues that lead to the heights of achievement. The law of mental attraction functions similarly to the law of gravity. It is more precisely defined. Birds of a feather flock together, like attracts like, and things equal in the same way are equal to each other are common expressions of the law. People of the same pattern and kind are chosen for people by their ideas and actions. Since no two people think similar, and hence do not commit the same errors, it is challenging to pinpoint where someone fails to attract their wants. On the other hand, I outline and describe the three stages you can take to create a reality. You can learn what you don't do by closely observing the following recommendations. Interest is the first action that needs to be taken. Interest is what draws extra attention to a particular object or thing. Being worried about someone or something is undoubtedly involved. Interests have a tendency to visualize what already exists in the mind, in the physical world. Interests are things that are believed to bring happiness, pleasure, wisdom, and contentment. I recall a woman telling me that she always noticed handicapped people in a crowd before everyone else. They appeared to focus her attention on them and elicit pity from her. 
She had once been hurt and spent several months in a wheelchair. The recollection of the experience was still vivid in her mind and had sparked her interest. Due to the fact that no two people think similar, our interests are mostly unique. One person may be interested in something that another person would not be. Recently, my wife and I traveled to the desert to investigate the river's dried-up bed. She was particularly drawn to the glittering stones that are frequently discovered in this nation and include gold, silver, copper, and iron. I, for one, was searching for gourds that would naturally grow in damp areas. I was particularly interested in the type that the native Indians utilized for their ceremonial dances and employed in their hogans. Together, she was exploring the area in search of these unique stones while I was taking in the gourd-bearing vines. She probably didn't see many of the gourds, and I didn't even notice the stones. While strolling side by side, we were each looking in various directions because we had different goals in mind. We are blind to what is of little or no interest to us in life, and only see what most attracts us in it. This straightforward habit is where many of us can err. We can become so engrossed in things that are not prosperous, joyous, or healthy that we neglect the things we most want and that provide opportunities for our wealth and health. We fail to draw the bigger things that are all around us because our attention is so narrowly focused on the inferior things, either out of habit or ignorance. One day, a young man approached me and asked for advice on how to boost his income because he was dissatisfied with his meager earnings. He was an electrician, I found out. He spent several hours each day working. He enjoyed his home, garden, newspapers, and occasionally going out with friends. I informed him that I believed he would receive a good reward for his efforts. I continued by saying that he would have to pique his interests and achieve higher wages if he desired them. God gives the birds plenty of food and feeds them, but he does not give the birds worms to eat. At the very least, the bird must forage for food. Therefore, every one of us must do action in addition to wishing or praying. He made the decision to attend night school and trade newspapers for books and other resources because he wanted to improve his electrical skills. He developed an interest in radio and was excited about its potential. With the help of this desire, he was introduced to new people and landed a job with a developing radio company. He quickly tripled his little income and discovered a new pastime. Because he was unable to balance his interests and desires, only he is to blame for life's unhappiness. People find it so simple to allow themselves to go into a rut, and these ruts are always mental before they become physical. Those who are mindlessly and subconsciously going in the direction of misery and blindness. A really attractive person who had a condition that had caused her to give up and lose what she desired most came to me. This mother could be proud of her two lovely children, a lovely home, a husband who could support the family a large staff, and many servants. She wasn't happy, though, with all of this. She devoted all of her efforts to raising and raising her boys during their formative years. They were now married and constructing their own homes. Her husband was growing up and becoming a successful guy, which allowed him to go out to clubs and make new friends, both men and women, while she was stuck at home. He spent most of his weekends away because he was so busy pursuing his interests, he only returned home at night. She had a large house, staff, and a lot of money, but she was alone and lacked love and happiness. She was obliged to hunt for a way out after realizing that the split would get worse and that her husband would soon file for divorce. After a thorough investigation, I discovered that she was interested in art and literature, so I suggested that she travel overseas for the summer to experience new places and schedule a winter filled with new coursework. She felt refreshed and ready to start work when she returned. She joined a literary group and found it rewarding. She gradually took on a few minor dramatic roles before her passion in the profession turned into a strong desire to advance at some point. Home, servants, and loneliness all vanished along with the new goal. He quickly advanced in his radio profession and achieved great success. Her husband nearly felt envious of her attention. Her children were proud of her success, and she was really happy. You see, one needs to keep up a certain level of interest. To maintain one's appeal and satisfaction, 
one must keep their minds engaged. Our ideas should be guided by our highest interests, not by goods. Only through material possessions can we show our interests. A powerful idea or principle serves as the foundation of a magnetic force. Our interests are guided by this notion or principle, which in turn creates an attractive force inside of us. If we talk about attractiveness, a young woman I must refer to as a friend is not very lovely, but she is quite appealing. She has a large group of close friends and is charming wherever she goes. When questioned once about what it was about her that seemed to have her admirers under her spell, she replied, I cannot give credit to my body nor to my brand of cosmetics, but I think it is because they like my frankness, my truth, and my pure mind. It is possible to cite countless instances of men and women who became famous and successful as a result of their love for and adherence to specific moral values. According to the law, good is always accomplished by upholding such a concept and carefully pursuing the will. Warning. Being extremely interested is not sufficient. This enthusiasm must be applied to our regular tasks. Our focus must reflect our interest, and the more seriously we take anything, the more intensely we will focus. The facts of the outside world are drawn by our curious attention as they take shape in our minds. As we focus on what interests us, our natural magnetism brings to us a lot of ideas that are comparable to our own. When a large portion of our interests are given our whole attention, we will discover that the majority of our small-minded and selfish inclinations are consumed by our higher interests, and we will make steady progress. When I was still a university student years ago, I recall frequently passing through the Williamsport station where a man had offices and was at the time a junior supervisor at the Pennsylvania Railroad. He frequented the premises even after hours and in the late hours but I could see his office was lighted up, and I could see he was actively working to complete some significant tasks. He appeared to be interested in his work, and he gave it all of his concentration in order to please his employer. Years later, I finally got to meet the man, and that's when I realized why he had always been given promotions to higher-level positions. He is now standing next to the largest railroad in the world's vice president. He gave everything he did his all and he didn't stop working on it until he was satisfied with the results. He told me that he wasn't shocked by the pay increase. He claimed, I just finished work, and the advancement came without my worrying about it. I believe that years ago, when he believed it to be unrealistic idealism, another young man put this law into practice. For whomever wishes to save his life will forfeit it, he remarked. Go two miles with whoever makes you walk a mile. Anyone who wants to be great must perform great service. Those who will get to the top must fall to the bottom. Those that go above and beyond without being compensated receive excellent pay. The person who is consumed by his own interests will eventually reach admirable accomplishments. Yes, you might respond, I know of guys who had similar privileges and opportunity to thrive, but they did not succeed as your buddy did. Emerson once observed, See how the mass of men worry about unmarked graves, while here and there is a great selfless soul who forgets himself in immortality. They had power, wealth, and intelligence, but for some reason they were unable to rise to the top. Even if they had every material and physical advantage that a typical man could need to attain the pinnacles of achievement, there was still something lacking in them. All success has a hidden source and cause that must first be given attention in theory before being given in practice. I want to say this. If you adhere to the idea of honesty, then do everything in your power to uphold it. Pay close attention to acting and thinking honestly at all times. If you ever have the chance to steal or defraud someone else, follow your moral code and don't let a seemingly little situation tempt you. At first, they always look insignificant, but this is actually only the beginning. Such dishonesty spreads like cancer. You rarely succeed in upholding your standards, but with time, you will be able to not only recognize, but also experience your own satisfaction. When you examine your connections carefully and the likelihood that each issue will adhere to your standards, you fill your mind with honesty, which acts as a magnet to draw sincere effort and long-term success. 
After then, adopt the truth and behave in accordance with it. Truth can be contested in so many different ways that you don't have to wait until next week or two to finish your assignment. It grows into something. After some time, you'll realize that you're so interested in and focused on the truth in all of its manifestations that you'll stop attracting dishonesty or deception to yourself or your company. When I first started doing this profession, I still recall what I heard. A store owner spoke about a small woman who frequently visited to purchase cards and presents for her family. The woman was asked whether she would bring out some cheap products for the little lady, but she responded, Oh no, she is too honest to be cheated. I didn't understand her point of view at the time, but I do now. When we earn what the little lady had earned, this may be said of all of us. When Mrs. Davidson was at the shelves one day, the head of a college in the East stopped by our chapel. He claimed to have read a few of the books on the display case and to have been particularly moved by Florence Shin's The Game of Life and How to Play It. He believed that the title was intriguing and appealing to everyone. You know, he added, I learned to look at life as a game, and I started out as a poor guy with some advantages, but I played. I didn't receive the assistance that these books can provide. I was successful, and now I teach thousands of young men and women how to play. Three guiding principles helped me succeed. Truthfulness, honesty, and sobriety. I used these standards to gauge my life, and I was delighted with the results. If you haven't already, establish a baseline or benchmark for yourself. Build on just one idea or object at a time. You'll cease paying as much attention to a less productive interest as you work to focus on a positive one. You don't need to put in the same amount of effort as certain folks. When people should alter their brains to be free thinkers and fear dishonesty, they act dishonestly. The law demands us to make the necessary corrections within ourselves, and if we do so, it will continue to act in our favor outside of ourselves. Because our thoughts are what pique our interest and focus our attention, let's work to avoid the causes and sources that draw the things we don't desire. Expectation Our final action is expectancy. This is attention in a proactive manner. It is intense concentration. It's comparable to how a cat would act if it were calmly waiting in front of a mouse hole. The cat believes he will finally catch the mouse, so he expects to obtain his prize at any moment. The cat's curiosity and attention would not be as intense as they are now if he does not believe and does not anticipate catching the mouse. He wouldn't be as active with his energies. You'll be most motivated to work on a project when you think it has a good chance of succeeding. With expectancy and expectation, this curiosity grows stronger. By doing this, you create the success you are striving for. Your curiosity and focus must be used to build your expectations. Elisha asked the widow what she had that she might sell for money when she came to him for assistance with a financial issue that would determine whether or not her two sons would live in freedom or slavery as a result of their father's debts. Elisha instructed the widow to take additional pots from her neighbors, go to her house, and there pour out the oil she had, because all she had was a pot of oil, which was something. When she filled the final pot after he had filled the others, the oil was completely gone. Not even a drop was left. When she reached the last jar and the conclusion of her expectation, he had completed the lesson's procedure, and the supply was gone. Only the amount of oil she had anticipated, measured by the quantity of jars she had gathered, had been delivered to her. Elisha had applied the law, but she had already decided how far her expectations would go. Although she may have wished for much more, she only received what she anticipated. You may have many desires if you are working towards success, good health, or happiness, but you will only be able to enjoy what you can expect. You might only get as much as you expect if you harbor doubts or fears in your heart that your needs will only be partially or imperfectly supplied. When you pray for something and then feel fear or doubt, it signifies that your mental forces are dispersed and you are drawing only the things that your less powerful thoughts think and expect. A renowned doctor was questioned about why he occasionally managed to resolve issues that others had been unable to. I never wait until a patient is in danger of not surviving, he declared. 
Sometimes these treatment suggestions are quite straightforward or outlandish, but eventually something inside me clicks and I accept and apply them. When he was certain about a patient's recovery, he claimed that he had never failed to assist them. We expect success when we have a strong mental connection to the notion that mistakes are impossible. Our belief fortifies our thinking and the accepted principle acts like a magnet to bring anything we wish to us. Because to expect is to desire, and to desire is to attain. Law of Reception Understanding lowers the best thing to simplicity, and its absence simply makes grandeur appear to be complex. We must comprehend Christianity and uphold the law based on it in order to make Christianity practical. Christ's teaching demonstrates how to use God's compassion, wisdom, and power to turn around the undesirable outcomes of living a selfish life. One individual shows that he has nonetheless discovered the root via his words, actions, and deeds. God is the pinnacle of human perfection. He moves through man's faith and acts with redeemed love, intelligence, and might. The pursuit of a better life and the desire to have one's goal are not true pursuits of life. The law of God and the seeker's mind are held apart and do not unite to the degree and for the duration that any physical item is still in the way. In the same way that a man who has personal opinions and desires is constrained in his ability to understand and experience the unbounded authority and power that his Creator has bestowed upon him. Because of our limited understanding, we continue to prioritize having as the most important concept in our minds and ignore the giving spirit even though we are aware that we must give before we can have. Giving is the first law of all creation because it is the first and most important law of life. The law of existence in a crowded state or in inhibited action is the attitude that one has. A mind is paralyzed and has restricted options for action as long as having controls it, which is in line with the fundamental law of creation. The procedure of the law of giving and receiving, often known as prayer and blessing, has been substantially simplified thanks to radio. The underlying concepts are fairly similar. They are identical except for the fact that one is mechanical and the other is mental. When an operator creates a program, a vibration spreads through the air to carry out his plans. When it is projected, it no longer matters. The vibration is carried by the ether, or air, to any station that can pick it up and replicate it. When we pray, we vibrate with our aspirations. The strength, intent, and sincerity of our prayer define the force that receives this as well. When we pray, we frequently believe that all we need to do is keep praying, which prevents us from ever being prepared to receive our answers. As a result, we complain when they are not immediately realized. A dreamer or philanthropist is someone who consistently prays, sends his ideas and wants, and is so preoccupied with dreaming that he derives all of his pleasure from them. He is unaware of the fact that he will have to surrender time in exchange for all of eternity in order to accomplish his dream and keep it alive. After laying out a precise and distinct blueprint for what one wants, one must surrender that vision to God, letting it go like a ball you throw that has no cord to pull it back to you. Man's extremity is God's opportunity is accurate because once a person reaches their breaking point, they are unable to continue to strive. When he calms down, the law has an opportunity to give him what he wants, and things start to improve for him. Have you not noticed this at work in everyday items like books, clothes, invites, or the urge to see a particular friend? You may have once had a wish or concept, but you later entirely forgot about it. After that, you had the book, got the invitation, or ran into the friend you were hoping to meet while going down the street. But for some reason, when it comes to greater, more significant issues, we find it difficult to let go of our hopes and prayers, and stress and anxiety keep us from doing so. Nothing is achieved that is not worthwhile. The human mind is a sponge. We compress it with our anxious thoughts, but unless we are able to release the pressure and permit the sponge to regain its usual shape, it cannot become absorbent and receptive once more. Some people think that's all we need to do after we've voiced our needs through prayer or another means. Instead, we're developing a legislation that is now in effect, and this is just the beginning of our work. This law's foundational life premise is stated in plain language. 
Give and it will be given to you, it says. In good measure, pressed down, filled and overflowing. Giving always precedes and predetermines receiving, whether you are giving your thought, your word, your service, or your action. Some people may regard this law as a two-way law. That is, half the time and you should give, and half the time and you should receive. It is like the proposition of hot and cold. These are two sides of the same law. That is, if we focus on cold and hope and prayer for warmth, there are chances of freezing to death. What we need to do is to give all our thought and effort toward building a fire, or looking for that which will create heat to warm us. If we focus on receiving, give no thought or idea or desire to build on, we similarly can perish. The law says, There is more joy in giving than in receiving, and as you give freely, so you receive freely. Unless we are free to extend or give our desire our good, the law will have no model to work with. It cannot continue to provide any need without a reason. Many people try to make law work in reverse, and for that reason, it has little or no result. They say of themselves, Well, after I have had, then I will give. If you want any good thing, you must first give something good to build on. A young man gives his fiancée a gift, an old diamond. Later, when he has financial difficulties, a friend of his anxious to help him come out of it, writes him a kind note and wishes him every success in meeting his obligations. The fiancé pulls out the gift he gave her and suggests that he sell it to meet his need. The young man is displeased since he did not give his friend a real diamond. It turns out at the time when he needs help the most that the one he gave was an imitation instead of the real one. When it comes to giving, most people have a tendency to think before they give their money. Money, an object so passionate about men that they kill to get it, is by its nature as obedient to our will as long as we can. Hold it gently in your hand or fold it affectionately in your purse without feeling any resistance from its nature. With all the selfish ideas of receiving that man ascribes to it, man has not changed his nature or purpose. What is the significance of the fact that money continually passes through the hands of those who so greedily grasp it? Nothing. Nothing beyond the joy of giving himself by fulfilling his mission. Man may do some terrible deed to obtain it. He may pay for something harmful to his progress. But in all these exchanges, man, not money, loses value. Just as the sun shines on the just and the unjust alike, so money passes through deserving and undeserving hands to do its work. Its purpose is exchange without discrimination. Leaving the latter to the mind that is using it, money goes merrily on its way, losing none of its value in giving itself. Money has come to fill the need for exchange and is all about that end. Let our attitude toward it be what it may be. Money will remain true to its nature as long as it is necessary for its master man. If we fail to pay full value in an exchange, we fail to understand the law of prosperity behind the idea. Money represents the law of services. Its value is the estimate of the value placed on it by the mind of man, while its form is designed to ensure an easier exchange. When we give of our best in some useful service, forget about us, focusing on the joy of giving. Instead of focusing on returns, we find that our purpose and the purpose of money have joined and come together in justice and eternal good. So often I hear myself saying, Well, I give, and sometimes until it hurts, but I rarely see any sign of return. There is a right way and a wrong way of giving. There is careless, impulsive giving and careful, scientific giving. When we give to a person or group of people where we are retarding progress, we are wasting our substance. When we give to those who make no effort to help themselves, we should not expect a good return. Nature does not support a parasite or a slacker, but gives its energy to those who are struggling. Let the parasite and the slacker see that you will help them if they have made an effort to help themselves. But we, if we support a slacker as such, how can we expect any good performance? Rather, the slacker becomes arrogant and demands more and more, until we wonder where and when it will end. Once a woman gave her daughter a fully furnished house when she married, and she put her son-in-law into a good business. The business from year to year needed more and more funds to keep going and she continued giving her money to him until it almost ran out. 
when she was only able to make a small income and live in a room, he wanted to know why she had not been blessed for her generosity. She had given as she thought best, but she had paid with losses and bitter words. Her son-in-law had asked for more help until she could give no more. Then her presence had become unwelcome in their home, and he had invited her to leave. Her mistake was in her judgment. She was as guilty as her son-in-law, for she was part of the cause of his failure. She had turned away from the young couple and made them sink or swim on their own. He was sure they would find themselves. He had taken my advice, and within a year the young man had revived the business. For the first time he was operating profitably. Home life had returned to normal, and everyone was happy because their efforts were being directed into the right channels. The young man was proud of his efforts that allowed him to act well on his own merit. A practical interpretation of the law is when you see someone making an effort to help himself. That is the time to help him. But do not give substance to the one who will not help himself, or who does not even try. The latter type not only abuses your giving, but abuses you if and when you stop giving. Jesus gave his substance always where it would do the most good. He fed the multitude because they sought good, not because they begged for food. Nowhere do we find him giving a thought to anyone except those who desire to improve and grow. He admonished others to give wisely. Do not throw your pearls before swine lest they trample them with their feet and turn and scratch you. He simply meant, do not give the substance to those who cannot appreciate or improve with it. It is as foolish as giving a child a loaded gun expecting him to realize the danger of using it. Sooner or later the child, through lack of judgment, will injure someone or hurt himself, to the regret of all concerned. You cannot build something on nothing and expect something in return. If, in your giving, there is not the principle of a good, to some extent, no matter how small to be added, then you are casting your pearls far and wide. You are wasting your substance. Many have found tithing to be a successful form of giving, but the mind boggles. Why would tithing be more powerful than any other form of giving? It is more powerful because it touches the law of giving and receiving in a precise, orderly, or systematic way of giving. A methodical plan of giving is established that creates a constant flow of mutual good to receive. When a method of giving is sporadic or occasional, the method of receiving good is irregular and uncertain. Scientists analyze it. It is said that tithing gives man self-confidence, a confidence that enables him to build a positive mental attitude that attracts success. Others say the tithe gives considerable confidence because one has the ability to spend his money that way. This is because he is a positive type and attracts only positive and good conditions. Then there are others who have a spiritual view toward tithing and say that God is their partner and they are only paying one-tenth of their income as his share. Then, some make mistakes with tithing when they give it for selfish gain or when they make a business out of it. Remember, it is not the money that is given. It is the idea behind the giving that is so vital. If you give the money and do not focus on the whole, your mind is not free. Therefore, the results cannot be free and cannot come. The tithing, no matter what you may think, if you think about the whole, has a tendency to bring man in line with the law of giving, and his results will be in proportion to the honesty, sincerity, and spirit of his giving. Jesus praised and blessed the widow who gave what she had, her offering, in the church, but criticized the rich man who offered his sacks of gold. Why do you think he made an exception in this case, to praise the widow's humble gift? He knew that the law of giving was in action. It was the spirit of her gift that led to her blessing. When John D. Rockefeller was a poor boy, he was able to apply the law early in his life. When he earned his first money, he kept a record of his gifts and what he received, and he kept a ledger throughout his life. It is known that he gave away more than half a billion dollars. Perhaps we can judge why he received so much to give. But after giving, that is not all we have to do. Our next step is to prepare ourselves to receive the response or results of our giving and to receive, as the law states in good measure, pressed down, filled and overflowing. This is the most interesting part, because our preparation demonstrates our active faith. Instead of swinging and waiting, we are preparation and work. 
This, in turn, broadens our vision. It stimulates our interest, dispels our doubt and fear, and stimulates our power to receive. This was clearly illustrated by Elijah the prophet when the three kings came to him and asked him to pray for them that they might be victorious in battle and that they might have water to give to their soldiers and their animals. Elijah told the kings to return to their fields and prepare for the next day, prepare to receive the water they asked for by digging ditches. Now, if you have ever been in the desert, you know that it was a stupid idea to dig ditches in the sand and expect the rain to fall, but the kings did as they were told. They prepared for the rain by digging ditches, and the clouds appeared, and the rain fell, and the ditches filled. The men and their beasts were satisfied, their thirst was quenched, and they went into battle strengthened, they were victorious. Elijah, knowing the law, had commanded them to prepare, and had given them the easiest way to receive. The key to the law, then, is, we are continually drawing into life what we give and expect. Whether there are also good or bad things, it is governed by this same principle. You have probably made the observation, oh, yes, it is just as I expected, and especially when some unpleasant condition or circumstance has occurred. You invited the condition when you allowed yourself to expect it, because you thought you expected it. You can also expect a good to appear based on the same principle, and you can help deal with it by the method of preparation. Many failures in manifestations are there because we do not force our expectations to keep up with our desires. Very often we desire one thing and expect in our hearts another, which creates confusion. The Master said, A house divided from itself cannot stand. When the mind is confused, there is no cooperation, nor does it attract the strength it needs. Positive mental radiation will guide away all clouds of doubt and fear with confidence that all things will work in the right way. A law is use that can and will set things right. There is a power within, far greater than any difficulty you may ever encounter. That power will never fail. One can ask, Can I wish to have the things not ready for me? Can I ask too much of the law? Does the law keep things away from me that are not for my good? True desire represents the longing for life, the search for a fuller expression, and is kept alive by a continuous waiting for its fulfillment. It brings us ways and means for its manifestation. The principle explains, no desire is felt until the resource is ready to appear. No mind can be aware of a need or desire unless the possibility of its fulfillment exists. Your prayer, your desire and your inner drive are like a magnet, and the stronger they are, the stronger your magnet's power and the greater its attraction. You cannot ask too much of the law because it is unlimited and the resource is inexhaustible. You can only get what you can conceive, what you can understand. One can obtain only the equivalent of what one gives. The law holds no more back than mathematics holds back its numbers. You can receive some things that do not look good, but other good can come from them as mistakes in mathematics. Considering that you make a lot of mistakes, Mistakes allow you to be corrected to learn more about the law. After making one or more corrections, you will never make the same mistake again. So in this way the law has served you well and provided more knowledge. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. The law serves a free and willing giver. Whatever you give, give it with a free and ready spirit. Give without commitment or dictation, then it will return to you relieved of obligations or restrictions of any form. He who gives much, receives much. Giving your best means receiving the best in relation to the degree of your giving. The reason why so many people receive little is because they give so little. They are poverty-stricken because they refuse to give. Whatever the nature of your possessions, give and give in superabundance. Give life, interest, energy, thought, ability, love, appreciation, and willingness. In giving your life, thought and love, in doing willingly and well whatever you may be called upon to do, express your best, and the more you give the more you will receive. This does not mean that you should give selfishly and thoughtlessly, but do so in an orderly way so in life you will make full and proper use of your energies, faculties and talents. If today your abilities are small and your powers insignificant, 
Begin now to make deeper use of them, and they will grow. Remember the story of the master and his servants to whom he gave each a talent, about two, three, and a few more, and from whom he expected a harvest according to their respective endowments. There was no more joy in heaven for him, but the one who had one talent used it well, and the one who had many talents but did not employ them in useful service. Therefore, the servant with only one talent has the highest place. In other words, the individual who makes full use of what he has will be blessed with more and more good, for, in what measure you judge, you will be judged again. This is the path of growth. This is the secret of the law of reception. If the business world accepts the giving of service as the basis for success and progress, can we not accept the same truth in the business of life? This is not a religious reason. This is good logic or simple common sense, because if the law works in one area, it will surely work in every area, wherever we choose to apply it. Whatever you want in terms of health, success, happiness, wealth, or power, start walking toward it using this procedure. The law works. The results are certain because it is a natural principle. You can proceed without any doubt or fear of desire and expect all the good that you can achieve, use, and enjoy. When man's mind becomes selfless to the point of yielding to the law, man is reborn. Because his attitude toward the law, himself and his fellow man is changed, and his affairs take on the character of his newness of thought. Augmentation Law Each and every time everyone has either read or heard the charming tale of Aladdin and his magic lamp, which describes how a poor child accidentally encountered the tiny genie who forced him to locate a rusty old lamp. It was a magic lamp, and as he furiously stroked it, a small figure urged him to grant his wishes and appeared in front of him on a cloud. When we were young, we frequently daydreamed about fairies and other wonderful things we wanted we might have. But many of those wishes remained unfulfilled because we had no way to put them into action. Although we can't really believe in fairies, we are aware that the magic lamp operates on a similar premise. No. It is not a physical object that we can pick up and rub whenever we want to summon a genie and create our own supply. Rather, it is a mental state that enables us to apply the law more effectively, for our own good, and to experience enough pleasure and satisfaction to pass for magic or a miracle. This knowledge is the act of thanking God, the law, for what we want, and invariably our desire is fulfilled faster than we could ever imagine. Of course, this approach is not brand new. It appears in the entire Bible, beginning to end. Throughout history, people have frequently used praise as a way to solicit God's attention, favor, and blessing. We were taught early in history that individuals would offer their own sacrifices and lay them on the altar in order to gain Jehovah's favor. They believed that by doing this, which transformed their adoration into song and ceremony, they would be favorably treated and their prayers would be answered. Read the Moses Canticle and take note of its organization. When you read about the fall of Jericho, you'll see how the populace marched toward the city walls until they gave way and were conquered. You'll recall that the final psalm of David has been utilized by Jews for generations and has consistently proven to be quite helpful as you read it. Prayer produces results that singing hymns or blowing trumpets cannot, and it does not automatically win you God's favor. Although it has no effect on God in any way, your actions certainly have an impact on you. It gives you the opportunity to stand up, inadvertently touch the law, and receive its blessing. What was once an unconscious action or an unintentional strategy can now be accepted as true and used regularly to stimulate your good. Your excellent will be stimulated and increased if you grasp the straightforward technique of praise. When it comes to faith, Jesus once stated, a mustard seed of faith can move mountains. If you comprehend the influence of praise, this also has that ability. Faith is complemented with praise. Praise is the use of intelligence and insight, whereas faith is wisdom and understanding. Praise is the fuel that turns power into an active force, while faith is the boiler that houses a potent material. The fuel is a crucial component of the machine, if the boiler must constantly be handled carefully and the fuel that fills it must be handled with extra care. Like praise without faith, 
Praise without faith is like a cold boiler, an inactive piece of machinery. It might be lovely to look at or to talk about, but until it starts producing, it has no value. The intellect is stimulated by praise. It quickens prayer. It draws everything positive to you. It changes into a visible, useful substance. A woman was wailing vehemently and pleading with God in tears for deliverance. Is your God a God of tears and grief and anguish and pain? The master interrupted her, scolded her, and heard her. Oh no, God is a giver of happiness, joy, serenity, and love. You beg your father in tears, even though you long for happiness and tranquility. How can you get white when you desire black? Do you expect a snake if you ask for a fish? Do you anticipate a stone if you ask for bread? Because the immutable law is continually trying to supply you, you can only obtain what you anticipate. Prayer shouldn't be a cry for help when you're down. It ought to be a prayer that exalts, demands, decrees, praises, and expresses gladdened thanksgiving. The law of the Spirit is represented through praise, which is a means of prayer. While all other forms only feed on arteries, praise has a wide root. When a man praises, he opens upward to God through this law. He advances consciousness and establishes himself as a big conduit for the blessings that are constantly trying to find him. He can approach God and become more in tune with the divine powers inside him by using praise to open a small door in his thoughts. The fastest method to experience successful prayer is through praise, which is also the quickest way to complete any manifestation. While its opponent, condemnation, confines and closes the intellect down, praise opens it up and expands it. Praise is received favorably by all of creation, and he is happy. You may have seen how a coach would offer his kids a pat on the back or a treat he enjoys after each performance. That man is savvy to use the law to get his students to perform at their best by bringing out their best enthusiasm. You've probably seen how happy children get when they get praise. Those who struggle with their slaves or assistants can learn a lot by employing this strategy, and the quality and volume of labor completed will significantly improve. I have no doubt that you have encountered this law in your line of work at some point. Have you ever tried to please someone only to have them criticize or condemn your efforts? Did you not feel like you were putting in extra effort? Maybe you also had the desire to delegate the task to someone else. After a while, such an event stifled your enthusiasm and energy, and you lost all motivation to improve. When the law is changed, this is how you respond. In light of this, receiving praise for your achievements makes you want to improve and strive for perfection. This pleasure increases your interest, and you begin to spread your enjoyment throughout your surroundings and at work. Since I have witnessed commended flowers that lived longer and improved in beauty, it is well known that plant life is likewise sensitive to praise. There is a physical reaction in our body when we receive or give ourselves praise. Our body's cells react to the law, according to doctors. They appear to learn and grow in power, capability, and even intelligence. Of course, we are aware that the enlargement is the result of the mind operating through each cell. Every cognition is mediated by an ether that is unseen. The law of spirit reflects the law of physics, just as water expands into energy when heated and turns into a solid mass of ice when chilled. Although we are unable to fully feel or comprehend it, our thoughts constantly move through this intangible ether and change in strength and sophistication. The mental climate is substantially heightened when we celebrate God's abundance and might the law, since it can be seen in everything our hands and minds can touch. This increase has an impact on who we are. We must consider the reality that the contraction and our results are postponed or frozen if we restrict our thoughts out of fear, condemnation, or criticism. It has been demonstrated that praising inactivity is effective. When the law of praise has been applied, lost friends have found their way back to you. A man reported hearing a click in the back of his automobile while driving to me. He had spoken to his car and thanked it for bringing him home swiftly and safely. After traveling another 30 miles, he safely arrived at the driveway. He found a broken axle when he tried to move the automobile a bit further. 
I received a letter from a woman complaining that she was sick of staring at an old carpet that had served its purpose well, but had seen better days. She spoke lovingly to the old carpet as she tried the praise technique. She received three brand new little rugs in the same week, along with a new carpet made to her specifications and delivered from Colorado in a matter of days. Her husband instantly decided that they needed new furniture after noticing the contrast with the new carpeting. Overall, the law was effective, and she obtained a newly furnished living room by complementing the old carpet. It doesn't matter whether the changes are made to inanimate objects or to people as long as the intended outcomes are obtained. The application of the law is impartial. Even better, even if praise is beneficial to other people and things, it also serves as our means of redemption. Our observations and entire attitude on life are altered by praise. In the past, we used to focus on our own flaws as well as those of others. But nowadays we have a different perspective. We search for accomplishments, goodness, and beauty deserving of commendation. In turn, this has a dual impact. It enhances our humanity, enabling us to inspire gratitude, joy, bravery, and happiness in all those under our sway. It has an impact on our inner selves in such a way that our memory starts to hold on to all admirable thoughts that are conveyed to it. As a result, a new way of thinking is established, and the old destructive ones are progressively replaced by the new. As a result, thinking positively about ourselves becomes second nature, and we start to live lives that are deserving of praise. More important and powerful than applauding with the intellect or lips is praising from the heart. Praise doesn't flatter or affect God the way that superficial praise and applause do for some people. God is not the target of praise. It is a tool to help man climb above and become sensitive to the law of God, and is only intended for man. It enhances his level of consciousness, enabling him to move away from his lack of it and toward the positive aspects of himself. Praise increases a person's vibration, speeds up their activity, energizes their faith, and connects them to a higher plane of consciousness. We copy from the Israelites a practice that falls every year. Every year we have a thanksgiving service, and many people think it is for us to express our gratitude for the past year. If one thinks for a moment, one can easily see that this is a reversal of the law of praise. Such a service should not be a review. It should be an anticipation. That is, a true thanksgiving service should be an expression of our faith, not in the past, but in the present and the future. Many of us are stuck. We want our pay in advance. We offer praise after our barns are well filled. If all goes well, we are willing to take a break to give thanks for our good fortune. Anyone can be thankful with the gift already in hand. If conditions are bad, our harvest meager or problems plague us, we are inclined to forget praise and are preoccupied with our failures and often blame God for his neglect. When we can sing praise in the face of adversity, adversity will soon disappear. This is not a promise. This is a law. Learn to do praise, to be thankful for the good at hand, and you will have found the magic lamp of the Spirit. This mental attitude not only brings forth your desires, but also generates your confidence, strengthens your faith, and builds a guarantee for things to come. Thus, being able to praise when things appear darkest invariably forces the sun to come in. Our degree of faith in the law and in God is measured before we receive it, not after. It is that degree of faith that determines what we will be able to receive. This is what Jesus knew when he said, Whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you have obtained them, and you will obtain them. Praise is this belief in action, and the action is in the present time. It is now. Examples from his work show us how he dealt with his problems. In one case he turned to the patient and asked, Do you believe? For another he questioned, Do you hear? In one of his most difficult trials, that of going to the grave where his dear friend Lazarus lay dead, we see that his approach is no different. He stood up among the mourners, and his first words of prayer were, Father, I thank you for listening to me. What could one be thankful for at a time like that? But the master knew that he was grateful for the answer to his prayer, 
that Lazarus would be brought back to life again. He cried out directly in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And in the book we read that Lazarus moved into his grave and the clothes were returned to his body again. At another time, ten lepers came to the master asking to be healed. He told them to go and show themselves to the priests. Later one of the men returned and expressed his gratitude to Jesus for being cleansed. Jesus turned to him and asked, There were ten, but where are the other nine? To the one who touched the law he said, Get up, go. Your faith has healed you. One in ten showed his willingness to return with a grateful heart. He received lasting healing. Many students fail to repeat their demonstrations because they take too much for granted or become heedless of the law after they have enjoyed some blessing. One of the first requirements of the law is that we always keep an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. If we hope to receive good from God, we must keep ourselves receptive, and praise is one of the easiest means to achieve this. Always be grateful for things, and much more will come. We must tend our thoughts upward always, and praise is the means to do so. If there is no ingratitude in your mind and heart, immediately start learning the Psalm of David, Praise the Law, Lord. As we tune our thoughts to God's law, that law serves us in proportion. This Russell Conwell of the Philadelphia Baptist Temple must have clearly understood when he asked his people to participate in a special praise service of song and prayer. Anyone in his church who wanted to pray for his problems was invited to come and bring his offerings, leave his name, and state his need. A man of little means came and asked that his daughter's name be given. She was a patient in a psychiatric hospital and had to be taken away for that reason. The following week the praise service called to visit his daughter in the hospital and was surprised to find that she had been declared cured. A woman brought her jewelry and placed it on the altar as an offering. She was afflicted with a physical problem and was in pain. She was able to walk without the help of crutches. When she left the church after the service, she tripped and fell on the steps. As she got back on her feet, she realized that she had been healed. Another woman, a widow, came with her obelisk and asked if she could keep her house, since it had been mortgaged and there were past due payments. She went home, but shortly thereafter it seemed to get worse. There was a leak in a water pipe and she was forced to call a plumber to fix it. How she would pay for it only the Lord knew. When the plumber tore up some floorboards to repair the leak, she discovered a kind of money that her husband had hidden, and the amount was more than enough to pay the mortgage and the plumber. These events are all true, and can be repeated by anyone who wants to fulfill the law as this minister believed. The law cannot succeed when we fail in it. Learn to turn the law of praise into whatever you are praying for, and you will see it in action. Praise is faith in action. A faithfully observed law will always be able to reward the observer generously. The law of praise will take you from sickness to health. It will raise you from ignorance to intelligence, from poverty to wealth, from weakness to strength, from fear to courage. In fact, the law of praise will promote in all things and in all ways. Start using the law now. You don't have much to begin with, you say. Well, neither did Jesus when he had about five thousand hungry souls to feed. He had only five loaves and a few fish, yet he did something with them. He started the action by praising the little one at hand, and then moved on to something else. You know the story, and the master said that what he did we could do? There are no exceptions to the law. How can it be done? When you learn to take what you have and build on it, not with contempt and condemnation, but with praise and gratitude, you are working the law, and the law will give you an answer. Praise life which is everywhere good. Law of Compensation One often hears people proclaim, the world owes me nothing, with a reckless attitude and a willingness to live their lives as simply as possible. The argument that one should obtain a pension so that they can survive on an amount of $200 or less a month is one that is frequently made in front of the fire at the dinner table, on the radio, and in political debates. Therefore, when we hear the statement, most of us are familiar with it. The phrases, I don't deserve this, and how unfair life has been to me, 
are frequently used to describe loss and defeat. Why should they own more than I do? I am equally as skilled as he is. These comments keep coming up in conversation. According to early religious ideas, justice will be served in a subsequent life. The wealthy and powerful, who at the time were the impudent and domineering, were doomed to receive their just rewards in the end. The unhappy and destitute were told to commit their lives to religion and the church, and if they did, they would undoubtedly get substantial rewards in the hereafter. But when one understands the law, such an attitude is never recognized as true. The promise of heaven and everything that glitters was never considered as a prospect of future attainment to make up for their struggles in this life. We must confront this law of recompense sooner or later, and it follows that we will always receive what is rightfully ours and nothing else. Do we find a balance to the effort of living when we apply it to life and examine its predictable outcomes? Are we happy with the service we are getting? Are we being compensated fairly for our work? Do we truly believe that what is ours has been given to us? The majority of individuals are unhappy. Some even go as far to claim that life is not worth living. The overwhelming majority affirm that misery, illness, and poverty are a fact of life, and that injustice persists in the globe, and more specifically, in our lives. Studying the rules of truth teaches us how to use them in a way that will cause all of our negative ideas and circumstances to vanish. The errors of a schoolboy originate from miscalculation rather than from the law's intelligent execution. As long as he uses the law without making any corrections, these mistakes will keep happening. Until he modifies the way he applies the law, these mistakes will persist. He must alter his usage of the law in order for it to be applied correctly because he cannot change the law to make up for his mistakes. It is our responsibility to change how the law is used or used in order to achieve better conditions than we have had. The laws of successful life are identical to the laws of science. The supply and possibilities are always the same and are available. This presentation will demonstrate how the law may be used to move you from where you are to where you truly belong. Your natural habitat is where you can experience prosperity and success. The law has made this possible. Failing to recognize these things is an error of judgment. There is no need to alter the law. Success or wealth need not be attained. They already exist. However, it must also adapt. Once that happens, your company will do the same. Where is the change possible? Your thinking is the source of all motion and the master controller of all action. According to Emerson, a man's thinking is the key to his success. Why do inmates fight for the warden's keys? Because there is another route out, and they can find their independence in the outer world. You cannot break free from your chains without the key, which comes from using your mind properly. The proper adjustment of your thinking is the secret to living a successful life. You cannot be imprisoned if your thoughts are positive and accurate. If you are sad and dissatisfied, better things will motivate you. How can you expect to be different if you want to success and riches, but make no effort to change? A drinker never recovers until he makes the decision to give up drinking. Until you decide to quit a habit, you are not the master of your life, whether you have one or are obsessed with it. You will never be able to overcome your poverty and privation until you alter your perspective on it. Many, many people go through life and death just knowing what has been passed down to them. The circumstances will alter once your point of view does. A condition will only stop drawing our attention when we stop being able to recognize it. Only by altering our conceptions of something can we stop recognizing it. Have you been to various homes and discovered that they are all unique in some way? Or were they drab, dismal, cluttered, dusty, and uninviting? Were they clean, neat, bright, and cheery? The home is an image of what the mind is contemplating. Its appearance reveals the janitor's mentality. If you want to succeed, look around your home. If order is the first rule, then order must also be the first thing you do. No, a house may be neat and tidy, even if you use storage boxes as furniture. A lack of funds is not a valid justification for an untidy home. 
You need to modify your thoughts in the appropriate way to get the best things if you want a better house, a finer surroundings, or attractive furnishings. The little things matter, and a lot of little things add up to a large thing. If you are incapable of maintaining your current home, it is pointless to wish for a new one. In our area, there was a fish shop run by a couple. They failed to maintain order, were not always polite in their interactions, and failed to produce. After suffering numerous losses, they closed and sold what was left. The couple that purchased the company updated the fixtures, laminated the handles, sanitized the space, and covered it with tile panels, making the shop appealing and successful. They started doing business immediately away, earning a reputation for serving wholesome food in a spotless environment. Despite the pre-existing circumstances, their business continued to grow gradually until it became essential to rent an additional space in order to expand the store. After a few years, this identical company and location saw these two people succeed where others had failed. The legal system supports self-help. This is always how the law of compensation operates. You invariably bring out the best in yourself when you carry out your duties to the best of your ability or when you do your work well. You become more competent and effective. You improve, demonstrating your supremacy in development. And according to the law, a stronger will invites stronger and better things to happen. The underlying idea is that you will start to draw yourself into something bigger when you get too big for where you are at the moment. You cannot attract the best until you get bigger. Anything you receive must be earned before you can keep it. If someone appears to be acting in that way, it won't last long since, in accordance with the law of compensation, they will discover their true place. Or, to use a phrase that is often used, like water, he will find his true level. Or, you cannot hold a good man down. Actually, your physical unfitness is the only thing standing in your way of growth. In other words, whomever fills their current position the most will eventually progress. This idea is essential to progress, growth, development, and evolution. Without it, none of these things would be possible. The office staff is negligent if there is a mess of papers, magazines, and bundles around the space, and if the boss desk is covered in stacks of mail, some of which is more than a week old. The activity reflects the organization's philosophy. The company is a reflection of its leader's thinking. How do we identify the origin of any losses? When we go to the top and influence his thinking, the entire organization is immediately transformed. Change the general's perspective, and you change the entire direction and goal of the entire army. It is incorrect to attribute your struggle to circumstances outside of your control or to other people. You are at fault here, not the law. You've got a mental kink somewhere. Your ideas are moving forward on your terms. Check and make adjustments. Are figs to be picked from brambles or grapes from thorns? This law was a major component of Jesus' philosophy. Give and it will be given to you. Do not judge or you too will be judged. You will be evaluated according to the standards you use to judge. Paul continued, Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Mathematically speaking, the adage, we reap what we sow holds true. Every encounter we have is for our benefit. If something unpleasant attracts us, it probably means that we need to awaken and develop a dormant or neglected aspect of our nature. We also learn from the encounter in order to produce something better. As a result, the level of pleasure and satisfaction we experience in any area of life primarily rests on our capacity to make the most of those experiences. After all, the law of attraction will only send us things that will aid in our personal growth. It must be recalled that we attract whatever we need, and whatever we require is always beneficial in order to understand this concept simply. This is the right mentality to adopt because every event is for our benefit, and we need the ability to understand this. While pursuing this practice may not always achieve the desired results, but it will ensure that your mind is constantly in harmony with character, beauty, and strength. For all this effort to realize the ideal is highly constructive and develops in you the qualities and conditions repeatedly portrayed in your mind.
clear, strong, positive thinking with definite ideals is a wonderful preventive of morbid mental attitudes and negative thinking, which leads to actions and conditions of weakness, misfortune, discord, and trouble. By constantly trying to satisfy and cope with everything, and use the good that can promote improvements, you are giving all your attention to the ideal and cooperating with the fundamental purpose of law. Repel all inferior thoughts with superior thoughts, bad thoughts with good thoughts, bad thoughts with good thoughts, distressing thoughts with pleasant thoughts, and you will begin to overcome the growth of all negative and confused wrong and discordant states. In other words, learn to think constructively of all people, all things, all events and all circumstances. Evaluate them from the ideal point of view. When you do this, it will gradually transform your whole life for the better. These are the means by which you can constantly promote your well-being and progress. When you train yourself to mentally seek the good, you will move toward the good. And when you form higher and greater conceptions of the good, these elements will be able to begin to find expression in your words, deeds, character, person, talents, powers, achievements, and accomplishments. That is, all things in your life will begin to improve as a direct result of your better thinking. This process does not imply, however, that you are about to ignore life's injustices, empty places, and underdeveloped states of being, but that you think rightly through and beyond them toward the hidden good or principle within that is always seeking a higher and fuller expression. You will, therefore, stop condemning and criticizing destructively. Instead, you will seek to bring out the good in yourself and others, and to discover and develop greater possibility everywhere. Whatever we possess today is our just reward. Very often it does not make us happy. We are not happy with it. But still it remains ours. This fact might prove hopelessly discouraging, were it not for a great truth that teaches us how to be free from all difficulties, freed from all obligations, absolved from all debts. If you want success in the life you live, you must exercise intelligent discrimination of your thoughts. When you speak in difficult times, money is scarce, you have hardships, you are sowing that kind of seed. What kind of harvest do you expect to get if the farmer sowed thistle seeds and then complained that his field did not produce wheat? One might say, fool, didn't he know to expect only what he planted? Never make a statement, no matter how real it seems to you, if you do not want it to manifest or chase it in your life. Do not say money is scarce. The statement will send money away from you. Do not say times are hard. That will tighten the purse strings so tight that even God will not be able to slide in another coin. Do not say that you are unloved or uninterested in other people's lives. Truly you lose their interest and love. The spiritual supply from which the visible comes never runs out. It is with you all the time. It will produce according to your request. It is not affected by the ignorant or blind speech of deprivation or loss. Only you are the one affected and control the demonstration of your thinking. The inexhaustible resource is willing to give. It has no choice in the matter. If you keep putting your thoughts into this substance, it will prosper you. Direct the energy of your mind on the ideas of abundance, love, happiness, joy, health, and they in turn will appear. If you desire a better home, make the one you have as beautiful as you can make it. If you want new furniture, new clothes, don't condemn or belittle the ones you have, but love them as best you can. If you want a position or a new job, prepare to fill that position or improve the one you are in. Thus, your inability to meet your needs in life is not a failure of the material. It is a failure within you of lack of understanding or lack of application. No matter what your problem is, the law can work on it but you need to adjust your thinking to make the law work. Do not expect that in a few moments or a few applications, you will realize a full consciousness of abundance. A builder does not erect a beautiful million-dollar spire or dome on a cathedral without a foundation. He must first have the support to carry that spire aloft. He builds walls and cross suspenders to hold each wall, and each wall is built slowly and perfectly, stone by stone. Law of Non-Resistance Our interest in this law of truth is particularly pertinent at this time because it appears like there is so much in the world to be satisfied with, 
satisfaction that, for many devout students, cannot be met unless some resistance is imposed. Despite all attempts to stop them, sin and disease appear to have increased. It is false and deceptive to think that resistance will bring about peace and harmony. True disagreement cannot produce peace, and neither can true harmony. Because resistance does not follow harmony and order, which is the law, resistance is successful. To some of us, the Master's teaching, that you should not resist evil, seems paradoxical. Because when we encounter the opposition, it seems natural to expend our efforts, assemble our spirits, and use whatever means we have to outwit and defeat the opponent, it appears that this is contradictory to how a body naturally reacts. Despite what might appear to be the contrary, when it comes to life's most important issues, we unwittingly apply the law to everyday affairs. This law has so many different titles that it is not always easy for us to identify it as the fundamental law of non-resistance. For instance, in the business world we learn about the psychology of selling, service, credit, free delivery, technical advisors, and every other imaginable assistance that will help us find the right pots and pans for the kitchen, a good style and color of a crib for the nursery, the chair for the fireplace, and the accessories that are so essential to showcase the living room effectively. Actually, there is a company that promotes that it has everything under the sun. As a result, whatever you need may be found there. They claim that using this law will make business profitable, and the department heads are aware of this. Why do you suppose they keep the doors to their shops wide open? It most definitely isn't to let in fresh air. Without even opening the doors, they allowed prosperity to enter. Have you ever observed that more people walk through open doors than they do those that are opened? Have you ever questioned why certain businesses, like five and ten or twenty-five cent establishments, like using the basement over the second floor? People find it simpler to move downward as opposed to above. When they arrive, they naturally take the steps up, although initially they are inclined to do the opposite. Any huge firm will employ this psychology liberally, as you'll notice. They frequently engage both men and women to investigate strategies for enticing and luring customers. They research the application of the law of non-resistance to the general populace. A salesperson will research the strategies for promoting a product. He will approach a consumer and thoroughly demonstrate his product. In order to dissuade the buyer from having any reservations or counter-arguments, he will steer clear of comparisons to other comparable items, extol the virtues of his own product, and highlight all of its favorable features. By doing this, he will create a persuasive sales pitch and influence his client to accept him. Before the client is aware that he is signing a check or a contract, he will get him to say yes to a number of things. The law of non-resistance serves as the basis for all sales. Everywhere in a profitable business it is used. The result of its utilization is department shops. Before they were done, our grandparents had visited a number of stores while carrying their baskets. Today we have access to the telephone, allowing us to order the things on our list, probably from a store. Mail order businesses rely on this approach. They create the conditions for prosperity in this way. Businesses don't only hire salespeople because everyone works in sales in some capacity. Whether we are aware of it or not, we constantly sell ourselves to gain the acceptance or rejection of our friends. We always work to present our best selves because inside, we want our friends to think well of us. A young man will use all means necessary to land an interview if he wants to meet a specific young woman. He will then proceed, give it his all, and leave a lasting impression. You may wonder why all of this extra work. Considering that he wants to make it simpler for the attractive woman to want him and learn more about him, he is attempting to convince her that he is the finest possible friend and partner for her. As far as he is aware, he may be unintentionally applying the law of non resistance. Why is this young man acting so confidently? You'll likely respond, Oh, it's natural. It's a habit or a custom. That is true, but habit has such a strong hold over us that there are instances when, while pursuing affluence and good health, we unintentionally erect obstacles in our way. 
Some people are capable of working hard to succeed and to grow their financial fortune, but they also have a propensity of talking about and fearing difficult times. We might gossip about our neighbor or bemoan his strategy for success. When we watch the graph swing downward, we can be afraid of the state of the economy and worry about our investments and jobs. We act quite foolishly when we do these things. In fact, what a fool is a businessman who widely publicized the opening of the biggest sale of the year on a specific day? He shut the doors and barred everyone from entering after obtaining what he desired from his saints on the appointed occasions. The saints assumed he had either gone insane or did not want any business to come to him based on such an act. Whatever you want to call it. Some individuals can be downright insane at times when they want stocks and success, but block it by talking about poverty and strife. I'm not saying they're insane, but I do know they haven't figured out how to think appropriately, and when they restrict their inflow of good with negative discourse, they aren't following the law either. I received a letter from a kid who stated, I am working hard to eliminate deprivation because I have had enough. Stop working to drive away hardship and work only for prosperity, I replied in response to his statement. The law demands that we work with and for the things that we desire not against the things we do not want. We dare not devote our time, focus, or effort to anything that goes against what we want. This entails putting up barriers that are against the law and prevent our good from occurring. So how do we work for prosperity? By exhibiting non-resistance, being in sync with everything that is prosperous, and using all available tools to facilitate the flow of wealth. Although water is a highly strong element, its resistance is not perfect. Its removal of the toughest rock is visible. Before it unleashed its tremendous downpour, we witnessed it sweep everything. Nothing can withstand its force, including bridges, buildings, and trees. But take note of the way the huge river begins. It starts with a little river or stream high in the mountains, which receives its springtime nourishment from ice and snow. Additionally, take note of how crooked the stream is. It's nothing like the massive river that is finally coming in. You witness the small stream collide with a huge boulder, a downed tree, or other objects comprised of twigs, decaying leaves, and the like. Does the tiny stream stop at the obstruction, or does it wait until it has enough strength to push the opposition out of the way? The small stream doesn't care about the tree or the boulder because it's on its way to the ocean, a river, and ultimately another larger stream. It moves quickly through the obstruction without wasting any further time using quiet maneuvers to get past the obstruction, and destined to cross a river before becoming a part of the powerful ocean. As a result, we observe how that small stream navigates a variety of challenges while advancing toward its destination. Some people reject nature's approach and implement their own. When they come across a challenge, they halt moving forward to acquire energy and put and remove it. Friction is caused by the resistance they have built. Inflammation and irritation are brought on by the friction. Because of this, the lives of many people are demanding and challenging. It is horrifying how much human energy is wasted. People fall apart and deteriorate in every area of life like outdated gear. Keep in mind that beyond use and servicing, a machine's movement is not as important as its friction. Opposition and resistance constitute friction. If we struggle, oppose, resist, and support ourselves throughout life, we will undoubtedly face numerous challenges, and we are likely to become so preoccupied with overcoming them that we will lose sight of our true objective. We can anticipate a lot of pushback and hardship if we consistently prepare for them. As a result, even though we may be forced to work around a hurdle if we don't make an attempt to think about it and keep our focus on the objective or desire, we've set out to fulfill, if we persevere, we will eventually succeed. We'll succeed in our mission. Another thing we may take away from the stream is that it experiences more tough times the smaller and more resilient it is. It will initially face so many challenges that avoiding direct opposition will always be difficult. It employs the law of non-resistance covertly and increases in vigor and volume. Its path is more direct and there are fewer and fewer barriers as it grows into a larger stream than a river. The vast ocean is then not far away. That is how students are. 
They experience the most difficult obstacles and delays because they lack strength and insight. There will be many challenges and hardships as they travel along a new road in the truth. The sensible will accept the challenges rather than fight them, and they will proceed. They get more powerful and resemble a large torrent or river as they move forward in confidence and certainty. The mighty ocean, their ultimate destination, is not far behind them as their trajectory becomes more direct, their comprehension deepens. A woman recently asked for help in dealing with her problem. She explained that her house had been mortgaged and the time was near when she would have to make a payment, but funds were lacking. She had turned her house into a pension, hoping to get enough money to live on, but there were difficulties. She could not hold back her tenants because she was very quarrelsome and critical. The house was always in turmoil, no one would restrain themselves, and she was busy making efforts and always gripped by anxiety. It was explained to her that she had to use the law. She was not to oppose the good, but to strive to work with it. With all the friction and confusion in the house, she was to come back and use the law of non-resistance. This she tried to do, but because she was so demanding and mean, she found it rather difficult to be non-resistant. That evening, as she entered the dining room, she greeted the housemates with a smile. People were so surprised at the sudden change that they could barely eat. That smile was the first smile in months that they remembered. One man was heard to utter when she went to the kitchen to prepare dessert, the old lady has gone soft. And later that evening, they heard the greeting of a young man who had once again returned to rent and was trying to slip up to her room without being seen. She greeted him pleasantly and said she was sorry he had missed dinner. After a few weeks of this new plan, the woman began to enjoy it. She was changed inside. She saw her people in a different light. Instead of thinking of them as cunning, lying, and very quarrelsome, she saw the good in them, and they all became more and more like family. They too had changed. Gathering at the table with the family was regarded as a happy time, and the house filled up. Others had asked for a room if and when a spot became available. Even the young man who had tried to dodge it because of his delinquency had entered into the spirit of the new house and was able to get a job and pay rent. Needless to say, the payments on the mortgages were made, and the house was saved for the widow. She did as she was asked. She became non-resistant to the good. She made light of the many obstacles and confusion that appeared, and slowly worked through them. She kept her goal fixed in her mind. This in turn loosened the hardness within herself, and then reached out to others. Although she seemed to be too good to some, in doing so, she achieved her goal and won. In another verse, Jesus expressed the law more simply. He said, I say to you, love your enemies. Those who curse you, bless them. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who mistreat you. In studying his statement, one might at first believe that the master was favoring enemies, opponents. Not at all. Jesus was speaking to all those who wished to use the law. Extending a loving thought to anyone or removing the opposition and enmity that was once there. This removal must first be in the person's consciousness. Once the thought of enmity is removed from your consciousness, you do not attract the same condition again. Do good to them who hate you, because in doing good you rise above the thought of hatred and hatred, then cannot touch your life. Bless those who curse you, and pray for those who take advantage of you. Why? Blessing arouses the supreme good within you. The highest good within you can only attract a higher good from another. To attract such good, you turn around all opposition and abuse. Thus, to live the law with others you do not favor others more than you favor yourselves. It affects others because it turns away from them hatred, malice, revenge and the like, and their love and interest will be mutual. If a man resists a situation, he will always have it with him. If he tries to turn away from it, like a shadow it will follow him, and repeatedly he will meet it again. If he ignores the hardness of the condition and fearlessly works on it, there will come a time when he will have been absorbed and will have removed that difficult condition. Accept the condition as some evidence of the good. Seek that good, and having accepted it more and more evidence of it will come.
Be in agreement with your opponent is another way of saying that nothing useful and lasting is ever achieved in an argument. One who is convinced against his will is still of the same opinion. Agreeing with one only leads to wearing full armor, to gather all his strength in opposition to yours. Agreeing with him leaves him defenseless and in no need of his armament. Offering no resistance makes him easily friendly, and the one who thought he was your enemy will have the pleasure and privilege of being a friend. Blessed are the meek may seem to literally claim that timid souls are easy prey for their more aggressive brethren. Rather, it refers to those who are able to follow the law of non-resistance to the point of inheriting the earth and all things their own. To be meek does not mean to be an easy target or to be a doormat on which anyone can walk. I have heard that at this time one cannot be a true Christian and be easy and forgiving. In this day you have to be on guard to protect your rights so that the strongest and most violent do not prevail. You do not know what is completely required of a true Christian if you think this. We are not required to be a martyr to our faith, nor is it unchristian to be able to speak fearlessly and positively. We do not need to be an easy target, nor a doormat for anyone, because there is a greater power not to be underestimated, the power of the law when we use it. But this does not make us a fighter, but a master. It does not require us to be tough and turbulent so that we can achieve our rights. Our rights, when they are right, will defend themselves. They are their own defense. There is no one to fight their own battles. Now the law says that we act what we expect. So if one believes he is an easy target, a doormat, a weakling, if he expects to suffer impositions and have to resort to warlike means for his own protection, then those who take the sword will perish by the sword. The law of life reacts to man according to his understanding and application. Being meek does not mean that we are subject to the conditions of discord and disorder. We are meek only according to the law. Such meekness gives us the power of the Spirit. Jesus was so strong in the Spirit that his word was like a double-edged sword. It left bruises like a whip. Jesus, although he was a humble man, was not an example of weakness. When he spoke as one in authority to the scribes or in the temple of the money changers, he showed a strength that seemed incredible to his disciples to the extent that they implored him to be their king. Do not confuse meekness with weakness. Nature eliminates weakness, and so should you. Weakness creates weakness. This leads to deterioration and eventually to death and decay. To live wisely one must be strong and positive, though rightly meek. Such strength is not measured from a physical and muscular point of view, but in the mind and spirit. No one can truly be a bomb if he is not strong and gritty. Meekness, then, is that appropriate strength when you don't argue, when you don't get angry or cocky and proud, when you don't insist on having your rights in an argumentative way. Meekness is the steel of one's nature. Yes, it is enduring. Meekness is the strength with which you win an argument by refusing to argue. When differences of opinion arise and your opinion is right, the real victory lies in the fact that it is right, regardless of what others may say about it. In science we recognize the spirit of meekness as cooperation, persistent application, precise calculation, perfect harmony, symmetry of design and color, and so on. Perhaps the simplest illustration can be seen in our application of the law in nature. We exercise the spirit of meekness to accept the terms of nature, and the more we cooperate with the best or submit to her, the more abundantly we are blessed. We carefully select the best seeds and plant them in the right place at the right time and in the most fertile soil. We watch for water and cultivate the growing plant to ensure abundant yield. Why are we so careful, so precise, so non-resistant to obeying the law of nature? Is it because we are weak, want excessive work, and in general, simple-minded because of the utmost care and attention we are obliged to give? Only those who do not fulfill the law of non-resistance are foolish. With whatever degree the wise man answers the law with meekness, non-resistance, so he will be benefited. Thus, when man applies the spirit of meekness to the principles of his daily life, not to conditions, so will he be proportionately blessed. When you are perplexed, remember the little stream of water and how determined it is to reach the mighty ocean. 
Be determined to reach and realize all the good that is there waiting for you. Why put off its benefits by putting obstacles in your flow toward prosperity? Choose the path of non-resistance. Every worried thought, every fear, doubt, complaint, argument, and thought are just so many boulders, large and small, that you throw into your flow. These tend to change the course and lengthen the time it takes to reach your goal. Unite your forces for good with the good you are seeking. Remove and dissolve every obstacle from the blessing and be willing to understand it. Mark it no longer as an obstacle, but a stepping stone, bringing you your highest good. Law of Forgiveness There are some necessities of life that call for exceptional human abilities. The concern we currently have is that man will not grow to be able to meet the needs of the time. A serious risk exists at all times when one's character is lacking. The world urgently requires the guidance of a teacher like Jesus Christ. Jesus instilled in his people the virtue of high character. He was more than just a typical preacher because of the brilliance he possessed. He was the best teacher ever. He moved ahead and showed the way as well as paving the path. In the midst of extreme pressure, he proved to be more resilient than all the scribes and Pharisees who had accused him, as well as Pilate, the governor of all of Judea, Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pilate himself. While it is true that they briefly controlled his body as they put him through a trial and sentenced him to die on a cross, the harshest penalty imaginable, his entire intellect and spirit still had the upper hand. He was nailed to the crucifixion on Calvary Hill after being dragged through the streets in a prisoner-like state, but when he looked down on them and saw their mental weakness, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Always preferable to the one who has been pardoned is the man who is so wonderful as to pardon. He is better. He is more powerful than his opponent. When Peter the disciple was once hearing one of the master's many teachings, he became very perplexed. He posed the query, which serves as the foundation for this lecture. How many times must my brother sin against me before I forgive him? Up to seven times. He questioned Jesus. This was a kind act on his side, as the Jewish law he was familiar with permitted a man to be pardoned three times. Given that this was more than double the amount of forgiveness permitted by the law, Peter must have believed that the Lord would be content with his act of forgiveness. He was confused, but much more so when Jesus responded. I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Since it is obvious from this response that the gifts of the Spirit have no boundaries or bounds, such a period would be indefinite. Forgiveness must possess the same boundless nature as faith, hope, and love. I think that of all the commands, Jesus' teachings on man's ability to forgive sins are the least understood. Sin and its numerous ramifications are typically kept apart from one another. We were raised to believe that when a man commits a sin, the minister should be called upon to pray for the sinner. We call for a doctor when a man becomes ill and is having issues with his mind and body as a result of the sins he has committed. The doctor then commits to healing the body or making repairs in order to put an end to the misery. We are aware that this is, at best, a temporary solution. A collaborative effort between a doctor and a priest cannot result in actual healing or a long-lasting cure. Because he addressed both sin and illness, Jesus was both master and physician. When a man who was paralyzed was brought to Jesus, he said that in order to heal him, he must first forgive the man's sins. The crowd that had assembled to hear him speak questioned his behavior. They questioned, Who is this blasphemous speaker? No one save God is able to pardon sins. They couldn't comprehend how he could attribute paralysis to sin. However, some people refused to consider the notion that such a disease could be the product of a mental or spiritual weakness, and instead insist that it is brought on by a bodily flaw or organic disorder. Jesus made it very clear that the effect of forgiving sin would be absorbed with natural, healthy concepts, just as even the darkest darkness is absorbed with the light of morning. Darkness vanishes, and everyone is equally illuminated by daylight. The body acquires a similar state when the mind is filled with natural and healthy concepts. Thus, the work of our forward-thinking individuals who pursue a larger field of research and conduct healing through mental and spiritual processes 
is not novel. They only adopt the scientific findings of the greatest thinkers of our time, as well as those of all saints, sages, avatars, and masters. Jesus asserted that every behavior has its source in the mind. He basically maintained that an act may only be committed if there is lust present in the heart. Else, it is a sin. He also discussed how sin begins in the mind before a deed is done in another place. From inside, he remarked, from of the heart of man come up evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, robberies, deception, slander, conceit, and ignorance. Man is defiled by all of these wicked things that emanate from within. Scientists acknowledge the reality that the mind controls the human body, and that a dominant idea, whether subjective or objective, conscious or unconscious, controls every aspect of the human body's operation. All bodily states are produced by or brought about by the mind, according to those who research the mental processes. It is common knowledge that all forms of creation are governed by laws. An error is therefore labeled a sin when it involves the abuse, reversal, or violation of a law. A mistake, misunderstanding, or error of judgment is a sin. Making a mistake entails breaking the law, whether it be natural or supernatural. The only way to comply with the law is to make corrections. Thus, the only ways to change and fix the mistake are via repentance and forgiveness. They are the only way to liberate man from the agony and suffering that come from making mistakes. He can only comply with the law and live in line with it if he has them. In order to forgive someone for a transgression, we must also forgive, forsake, and forget the person's circumstance or thought that led to the sin. It refers to giving up or letting go of something that is improper. One must be forgiven and released from the sinful repercussions of erroneous thoughts or ideas in order to release them. The first condition for a man to be in accordance with the law of his being is forgiveness. Who is qualified to define the law? We could query. The law can be understood by those who research man from both his mental and bodily perspectives. He would go nowhere if he tried to understand the law solely by looking at physical deeds or the effects of sin. He would keep going in circles, which would be pointless. He will see results if he investigates and studies the factors that led to the sin. He must examine the circumstances and look for anything that has shocked him, anything that has been buried or forgotten, or the condition that might have led to the illness. Then, despite all the temporary painkillers that can be used, this situation will keep returning unless this notion is permanently erased from the unconscious mind or memory. Similar to weeds in your garden, if you trim them back every time they pop up before your eyes, they might only disappear for a short period of time before sprouting back because they have not been completely eliminated. To entirely kill and eradicate the roots, they must be completely removed. Speaking in front of a group of medical professionals about how this thought was the cause of the illness, one doctor was quoted as saying, Abnormal tumors and cancer are due to a long period of the pain and suppressed anxiety. Another way to state that these illnesses result from a lot of sinful thoughts that are buried and locked up inside of our heads. It could be prudent for us to look inside of ourselves and observe the impact our emotions have on the physical organism if this state were so damaging. Then, because they have a crippling and upsetting effect, we use every strategy at our disposal to get rid of them. Most cases of functional mental disorder are due to guilt, observed another outstanding psychiatrist. Some people feed and clog their thoughts because they want to be forgiven. A diseased mind is typically reluctant to forgive or release them. This is expected because they would no longer experience any mental illness if they could let go of and forgive the terrifying thoughts. In an experiment to evaluate the emotions and reactions of the body, Professor Gates of the Psychology Laboratory in Washington, D.C., discovered some intriguing findings. He discovered several positive feelings in addition to roughly 40 negative ones. He claimed that among all negative emotions, guilt-related feeling was the worst. This conclusion was established after a chemical examination of bodily perspiration. Each emotional response resulted in a small amount of sweat that was tested. The negative mood had a powerful acidity. You know what will happen if you apply acid to your flesh at this point. Your flesh's very tissue will be destroyed by the acid, which will burn and sting incessantly while also being uncomfortable. When these damaging thoughts are permitted to enter the mind, a poison is produced that weakens and eventually kills the body. 
This is the exact chemical response that affects the tissue and the body. One day, a knowledgeable doctor got a call from a patient who had been visiting many doctors and receiving treatments, but hadn't been able to recover. In truth, he was becoming worse, and in addition to his initial disease, he also had a condition that caused him to get increasingly depressed and had a propensity to commit suicide. Knowing that the patient had gone on rounds and received medical attention, the doctor made the decision to examine the matter from a psychological perspective. He asked questions and thoroughly analyzed each answer. After some time, he earned the trust of his patient and discovered the true secret cause of his protracted illness. The man and his brother had been business partners many years before, and during that time the man had appropriated and lost some money that should have belonged to his brother. Even if his brother had looked for it, he had used it in a way that prevented it. He had since retired from that position when they broke off their business relationship, but he claimed he would never be able to forgive himself for accepting the money. He wanted to give it back, but he was unable to do so without telling his brother the truth. He claimed that the possibility of losing his brother's love troubled him more than the thought of facing legal consequences. They had always been dedicated to one another and had never been apart. He was afraid to own his mistake and try to make amends in any manner possible because of this. The best course of action, according to the expert, is to release this unseen pressure. The only way to accomplish this was to call his brother and clearly reveal the entire situation. The suggestion was rejected by the patient, who then went home and gave it some thought. After suffering with himself for three hard days and sleepless nights, he decided to visit his brother and called the doctor three days later. He was in such a state that he was aware that the punishment his brother would administer once he learned that he was a thief might be more severe than the condition he was experiencing. He related the incident to his brother, who surprised him by encircling him in his arms and sharing in his joy at having come clean. They were ecstatic because that cloud, the lone cloud in their lives, had vanished. For those who had no idea what had been swept away, the restoration of the patient's health and the clearing of the skies were remarkable events. The guy was able to follow Jesus' instructions to the judged woman to go and sin no more via repentance and forgiveness. His memories had been stripped of the profound pain. His ideas were free to be positive, pleasant, and wholesome. Her body was able to recuperate swiftly as a result. This may have appeared miraculous to some people, but not everyone. It followed a natural law in an unfettered manner. Given these undeniable realities, it is easier for us to see why Jesus spoke about pardoning sins so frequently. He was aware of the fundamental significance of the law of forgiveness in every man's life. The more we study, the more we are amazed at its simplicity and precision of implementation. We have to forsake, as Solomon tells us, a sin forsaken is a sin forgiven, to forgive, to release a part of us that is not good for us or pleasing to others around us. Thus, we repair the violation if we have missed the mark, made a mistake, or sinned. Weeds will not be removed over time. Instead, they will increase and grow stronger until they choke the flower. The same thing applies to our sinful thoughts. In the garden of our memory, they must be plucked out, driven away, and destroyed so that only the flowers of healthy and happy thoughts can grow. A man may have the habit of excessive drinking, and he is not only miserable within himself, but causes much unhappiness in his home. He desires to overcome this sinful habit. He is given every help by his friends and others to make him resist the desire to drink. Time after time he overcomes the temptation and then fails. Repeatedly his family forgives him and encourages him to struggle. Finally he comes to no longer want to drink. Then he is able to give up the desire to drink and overcome its sinful effects. Then he has abandoned not the drink, but the desire to drink. When man abandons the idea that drives the desire and determines the physical action, then and only then does he have the right to forgive and relieve himself of its debilitating effect. An abandoned sin is a forgiven sin when the thought or idea that prompted the sin is corrected. James explains the truth clearly in saying, Every man is tempted when he turns away from his lust and enticed. Then, when he conceives concupiscence, he commits a sin. Error. 
Simply put, it means that every man, when he conceives an idea that is wrong, destructive or bad, and dwells on it, eventually induces it to become a fact. When one wants to overcome a sinful condition, then one does not waste time with the fact, but corrects, forsakes, forgets, forgives the idea that started it. This is the weed in the garden that needs to be pulled out, stem and root, and to be completely discarded. In another time we find that Jesus repeats the law, and with some explanation. In his prayer he states, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a perfectly reasonable proposition. As we forgive those who err against us, so we will be forgiven of our sins. This law has followed us through time, and today we talk about it as if it were something new. We call it modern psychology. The law says that certain ideas must be dissolved and erased from the mind, so that other ideas or new ideas of a different character can replace them. This can be explained as a bottle that is already full and must be emptied before it can be filled again. Jesus said, Nor do men put new wine into old bottles, lest the wineskins break. For example, if you keep in mind that someone has offended you or treated you unfairly, you cannot get rid of your wrongdoing or injustice, as long as you hold that thought in your conscience. Often people complain that they do not understand clearly or have spirit enlightenment as others have testified. You only need to search your memory to find the cause. If you do not have the understanding you expect, first search your mind for the ruthless thoughts that have been slipped in without warning. Is the realm of your thought filled with resentment towards some person or condition? Do you have the feeling that you have been wronged by this person or that person? The law says, if you do not forgive their offenses, neither will your father forgive your offenses. We create conditions for ourselves when we fulfill the demands of the law. Some people ask, do we believe in writing off the debts of those who owe us? Or, literally, should we write off the debts of our debtors? There have been a number of people in recent months who have filled the front page of newspapers because he paid all the receipts of those who owed him money. Did that eliminate the debts? Well, the debtors gave great praise for such a generous soul, but they again went back to the grocer or the butcher and asked them to pay. In other words, they were glad to be relieved of the debt they owed, but they didn't know how to do anything but go back and open a new account. The answer is that as long as we believe in the necessity and reality of debt, that debt will continue to exist. As long as we believe in debt, we will be in debt and continue to bear all the burden and headaches that come with it. He who thinks that all men owe him is responsible himself for having debts. If we send bills to everyone who owes us, does that relieve us of the burden of debt? No, signing receipts does not erase the idea of debt from our minds. First of all, we must erase from our minds the thought that anyone owes us anything. This will bring us into a clear atmosphere in which we sow the seeds or ideas of abundance for those who owe us. In this way the debtors will find their minds more fertile ground to bring forth the thoughts of abundance. When they make the spirit of free thinking flow in abundance, they will be happy to pay their debts, and all that is rightly ours will happily return to us. In other words, when we free our minds from all thoughts of debt and seek to realize more and more of the presence of abundance, we will soon be strong enough to reach out and realize abundance for our debtors. When they are relieved of thoughts of limitation and deprivation, this will attract more substance with which the bills can be paid. In this way, and only in this way, debts can be permanently cancelled. Through the application of the law of forgiveness, both parties involved will be raised from a debt consciousness to a prosperity consciousness, and prosperity and abundance will abound. Everyone must at some time walk the path of forgiveness. We must learn to live the present law. It must be important because the Master taught us that there is hope of forgiveness for those who forgive. Only when we forgive are we forgiven. We must make the first attempt. Our will must open the way for our forgiveness. We dare not ask more of the law than what we are able to extend to ourselves or our brothers and sisters. Unless we prove this law by living it, we cannot hope to achieve the greatness of character that life requires. As we ponder all this thought, we may wonder if the Master intended forgiveness to be an essential part of the order of world events today. The truth is deeper in everyday life. 
when we remember the rivalries that prevail in almost every store and office, when we see the jealousies that divide a neighborhood, when we observe and feel the envies both scholastic and professional, when we have conflict and discord in our homes, we see the solemn, though simple teachings of abandonment of forgiveness deeply in your life and mine. If we are unable to forgive, we cannot know that we have a little soul untouched by the Master's teachings. These are our daily trials, for it is in the school of forgiveness that life's lessons are learned. Law of Sacrifice Each man ought to have a role model or hero. Do not put too much faith in somebody who claims to have nothing and desires nothing. A man without values will eventually prove to be detrimental to others, since he does not desire there to be anything bigger than himself. Any young person from age 6 to 60 or older should consider Abraham Lincoln to be their ideal hero. Lincoln started out at the bottom and worked his way up to the highest office that our society could imagine. Nowadays, it is difficult to discover a youngster or man about whom we cannot declare that he possesses more inherent talents and chances than Lincoln. He was straightforward and sincere, and he was determined to survive in his own world. Like everyone else, he had numerous flaws. Instead of completing any work, he would have chosen to relax his lanky body in a cozy position and continue to tell. He received the education that his wife desired for him. When he walked into the White House as our president, he barely had a few bucks in his pocket. However, a man is not created by money. Courtesy does not. Even education cannot enlarge a man's narrow soul. When Abe was a young boy with his mother, who educated him when she could, a seed of thinking was planted in his mind, and Abe's soul started to grow from that. Mrs. Lincoln became gravely ill one day, and realizing she was going to die, she gathered her family around her bed, resting her frail hand on tiny Abe's head and urging them to be good to one another. He expressed the wish that they would follow his example and live godly lives, loving their family members. She completed her mission and passed away with slumped shoulders, a narrow chest, a sorrowful, occasionally wretched disposition, and no hope of better circumstances on earth. She may have daydreamed, but she did little to prepare the ragged, helpless youngster who stood by her side for the glorious destiny that lied in store for him. Even though Abe was a very small boy when his mother passed away, he never forgot her. She imparted to him a lesson that he would remember for the rest of his life. She explained to him that the desire for discipline, enjoyment of it, and voluntarily making the decision to practice it, are the precursors of wisdom, rather than discipline being the beginning of wisdom. Thus, he discovered that self-control is the key to everything that makes life worthwhile. Today, attend a concert or opera to hear a voice that captures your attention. Fans are listening to the voices of your favorite musicians, including McCormick, Lily Pons, Thomas, Eddie, McDonald, and more. How do they bring it about? Oh, they're not going to make that happen. They may be very gifted, but discipline is what produces the spectacular results, not extraordinary talent. Discipline is actively sought after, passionately chosen, and patiently pursued. However, it is said that this age lacks discipline. However, this is untrue. We get the rewards of diligent work and discipline in every aspect of life, and the outcomes are well beyond anything our forefathers could have imagined. I'll never forget the thrilling experience I had while relaxing in front of a warm fireplace in my first house one evening. I nonchalantly turned on the radio next to my chair and chose a top station. I was surprised to hear Richard Byrd being called in the Antarctic regions of the South Pole. The commander then described the hazards and challenges they had faced while unloading and transporting supplies to their new home, Little America, the day before when the ice slope had split and snow had slid in. He would prepare a thorough report and send it to us through letter, which would take some time to get here. But here, in less than a second, his voice resounded, and I, along with many others, heard him as he described the day's happenings. Older workers would never have imagined such things were possible. The appropriate term is discipline, not happen. He was meticulous and had a scientific and technical discipline that led to this outcome. There is only one area in which our generation lacks discipline, and that is our morals. 
We are aware of the importance of discipline in science, the arts, athletics, and all other practical endeavors. However we let loose, need our time, let our instincts run wild, and let go of inhibition. Much of our moral life is characterized by the rejection of discipline. Men everywhere are realizing how important it is to control their thoughts and behavior. When it comes to ourselves, the most precious object of all, we let our thoughts wander. We carefully raise our pets, we use the forces of nature to serve us regularly and well. No one can succeed in their goals until they develop mental discipline and think in a controlled manner. Before one's mind is clear and their values are present and in tune with the divine mind, they cannot be considered to be truly religious. Except for those who seek God according to the law, no one can acquire insight and comprehension of life. We start by noting a basic truth. Always, something must be given up in exchange for something else. Everything in life is priced and available for purchase. You must purchase at the asking price. It is a daily adage that, I will give you this if you give me that. We refer to this barter by another, possibly more well-known name. Sacrifice. So our preachers have not been teaching about sacrifice. It deals with an unavoidable requirement. We have to abide by this clear legislation. Whether we want it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, we are making sacrifices every day of our lives. Whatever we desire in life, we must make a sacrifice in order to obtain it. A quote of the master that the modern mind struggles to accept and avoids. Few are those who locate it because it is a narrow path leading to a straight entrance. How we hate hearing these words. We want the roads to be free and wide because we are more liberal today. We assert our freedom and say that being so constrained is unnecessary. We do not take the straight, narrow road. However, there are some of Jesus' remarks that are more precise and comprehensive than that. No one will ever be able to discover the treasures of life in any realm to the extent of being able to wander around freely. He will always have to go through discipline, which is like a narrow door and a narrow path. Visit Chrysler's violin performance to hear almost celestial music. Watch the expert surgeon perform the delicate work of mending a damaged body so that the soul gets stronger. Think about the scientist using his scientific formulas in his lab. Recall George Eliot's statement that she began Ramallah as a young woman, but ended it as an older woman. Or visualize Admiral Byrd speaking to us on the radio while flying over the South Pole. Are these personal encounters? They certainly are. Achievement liberates life and is the most satisfying experience a man can have, but getting there requires discipline, and there are a few shortcuts. When this law of sacrifice is brought back into the moral realm, it is commonly presented as one-sided. We are taught that if we want to live a good life, we must have many pleasures. How familiar that sounds to some of us. The result is that rebellious, and when we think of sacrifice, we think of those who had to give up much pleasure for the good. Who are some of the great sacrificers in history? Well, there was Socrates who drank hemlock, there was Jesus who was crucified on the cross, there was Paul who was beheaded, there was Peter who was crucified upside down, there was Luther and Wesley and Calvin, all the religious people, there was Livingstone, Nightingale, and dozens of others. But think for a moment, are they the ones who made the most terrifying sacrifices? We talk about Jesus' supreme sacrifice on the cross. We read about the martyrdom of Saints Peter, Paul, and John. But what about Judas Iscariot? Think of what he had the chance to become. Think of the company he once had, and the place he might have occupied. Think of what he threw away. Think of what he had for it. I tell you, the cross was not a sacrifice to compare with what Judas paid. For thirty silver coins and by misfortune he set aside the richest opportunity for any man in all history. A young man who had disdained discipline, cast aside restraint, and had his escapade wrote as he sat behind prison bars, A thousand thousand times I paid for those few hours. This young man and his grandson, a few years younger than him, had attended a meeting in a town not far from my home and on their way home they were discussing the matter the minister had mentioned at the meeting. The argument degenerated into angry words, 
and by the time they got home, this anger had been fueled by a murderous passion. The younger man went to his room and took a gun and shot the. The uncle in turn struggled to get the gun and turned it toward the younger man and killed him. We should take this seriously and realize how the word sacrifice touches each of us. A man called my office seeking help with a very serious problem. He had a beautiful home, a beautiful devoted wife, and two wonderful children. It is true that the wife was spending a lot of time with the children, and the husband was going out to clubs and business meetings. He had met another woman and thought he was in love with her. Was this his problem, as far as family and home were concerned? There was only one way to answer that, and it is not for me or any mortal to decide. The law will determine it for you. You cannot have a beautiful home, a devoted family, and enjoy living dissolute. If you do not want to sacrifice or give up your free life for the sake of a nice home, you will be forced to sacrifice a nice home and loved ones to live free. You cannot enjoy the satisfactions and pleasures of true friendship and indulge in a bad mood. If you do not want to sacrifice your character for friendships, you will sacrifice your friendships for a bad temper. You cannot have a character to which friends will give respect and trust and resort to bad behavior. If he will not give up his circuitous ways for trustworthiness, he will have to sacrifice his trustworthiness for dishonesty. You can never be sure of this. No matter how far you can go before the rope is tightened, no matter how wildly or laxly you may live, even if you think you can get away with it and you do, you cannot fool the law. Something must always be paid for something else. All good in life, all success and happiness are like art. You must choose spiritual beauty to create and desire, then go through the narrow way to earn it. Because the beginning of wisdom is the first desire of discipline. Some say then, if you want to enjoy the pleasures of life, this means that your own freedom is impossible. It means on the contrary that you, who think so, have not realized that that freedom is real. This reminds me of a drunkard who was lecturing for the amusement of a few on the subject of freedom. He declared that he wanted his freedom, and that he had the right to drink as much liquid as he wanted, and no government could stop him. He was having his freedom, yet he was so drunk that he did not know what he was saying or doing. Freedom is not living an obsessed, undisciplined life. Freedom is being able to control your life and be what you want to be. If you wish to become an accomplished athlete, an efficient teacher, a skilled lawyer, or a beautiful singer, the beginning of such success is the first desire for the discipline of time and thought. If you wish to be rich, radiant in life, the rule is the same. An undisciplined life is a crazy life. We must surround ourselves with high ideals of clean, functional, and effective living under the highest leadership we know, or under the teachings and example of a master. The highest example of a master is Christ. In all his work and teachings he showed that discipline, self-control and self-mastery always precede wisdom and achievement. Mrs. Lincoln had taught her words to Abe, and it was because of this that Abe had grown in manhood and sacrificed his life of laziness, looseness, and heedlessness by making it through the narrow and narrow path of a life disciplined by principle and honesty and righteousness, which made him a great soul. It was the law of sacrifice that worked for him which enabled him to become the president and savior of a great nation. The proof of this greatness was manifested in his work in Washington. During the war, a young boy from Vermont, whose name was William Scott, was sentenced to be shot for being caught asleep in his seat. Now it was not Scott's post, but that of his friend whom he had replaced when he fell ill. The double duty was too much for Scott, so he had fallen asleep. He was so well liked by everyone that his captain and friends appealed to the president. Lincoln decided to go to Chain's Bridge and handle the case himself. He went to the camp and talked to Scott. Scott said he was the nicest person he had ever met. He said the president had asked him about his home, the farm, his friends, and finally about his mother. He said he was glad he could take a picture of her from his shirt and show it to him. Mr. Lincoln told him how grateful he must be to have a mother, and that he should make her a proud mother and never cause her another sorrow. Scott thought it was very strange that she had not spoken of her fate in the morning. Strange that she had advised him not to cause his mother another sorrow or tear when she was about to die. 
Finally, he gathered his courage and asked the president if he would grant him a favor, namely, not to face his friends, but that the firing squad was from another company. Mr. Lincoln turned around and facing Scott said, My boy, you are not about to be shot tomorrow. I intend to trust you and send you along with your friends. Since I had considerable difficulty coming from Washington, how are you going to pay the bill? The boy stammered his gratitude. He suggested that he could send him his savings. He could borrow money by mortgaging the farm. His friends would help him. And he also had all his army pay. Then Mr. Lincoln put his hands on the boy's shoulders and looking painfully into his face said, My boy, my bill is very large. Your friends cannot pay it, nor your kindness, nor the farm, nor your comrades. There is only one man in all this world who can pay it, and his name is William Scott. If from this day William Scott does his duty in such a way that he is not in danger of dying, he can look me in the face as he is doing now and say, I have kept my promise, then my debt will be paid in full. William Scott kept that promise. He learned the secret that Mr. Lincoln's mother had taught him when he was a boy. This was the law of sacrifice, and that the beginning of such wisdom was first the desire and love of discipline, that it was the narrow way that led to the high road all that makes life worth living. It was the road that had led Mr. Lincoln to the White House. It was the road that led back to the Vermont Hills, home, happiness, and mother. It is the road for all who persevere and find it. It is the road that Jesus masterfully followed. It is the road he recommends to you, for in it is the law of sacrifice working to bring you the joys and pleasures that always come from the wisdom and understanding that go with it. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord law has promised to those who love the Lord law. Law of Obedience It is undoubtedly not the goal of man's existence to feel discouraged, struggle for a while, and then emerge uncertain. Life should be more meaningful than this, and it is. Man should be a builder, and he is provided with all the resources necessary to construct the kind of life he desires. He develops knowledge or ignorance depending on his obedience, his comprehension of a divine law, and how he applies it to his day-to-day -day activities. Many people automatically assume that living rightly entails living a difficult life when they realize that the science of life is guided by rigid laws. When a law affects their relationship with the most beautiful things, they are terrified of it since it has its own requirements. However, these same people would oppose any modification of the laws that control human civilization. They understand that in order for society to be set up to operate peacefully and safely, the laws controlling social behavior and activities must be enforced correctly. In other words, they understand that without government, human life and welfare would be in constant danger. Government is for the good of mankind. If this is true of the legal and constitutionally established human government, it is even more true of the divine government. And the more requirements there are in the law, the more it will ensure that whoever complies with them enjoys security, prosperity, and happiness. The laws guiding the science of mathematics are the most stringent laws in all of science. Even when faced with a challenge, an accountant is aware that it can only be overcome by referring to the rigid rules that underpin all mathematical computations. Mathematical issues could not possibly be solved if those laws were subject to change. The concept or understanding of God, whether the God of Christians or the God of pagans, has maybe gone as far as any other area where religion has deviated from the path. Men have created their ideas of a God who is partial, holy and sinful alike, a God who can be convinced and bargained with, a God who gives life and takes it away, a God who heals illness and causes it, a God who impoverishes and enriches, a God who rewards and punishes, and having accepted this misconception, has made prayer largely a matter of doubt, lacking that strong conviction that the supreme intelligence is law, which operates like the laws of this part of truth gives rise to the delusion that there is one God who cares about everyone's needs and problems, and who is not a father figure to whom we can confide our worries and with whom we can converse. Mary cried out, They have taken away my Lord. The law, once understood, gives us the key to eternal happiness, peace and dominion or mastery over all the forces around us. Eventually, however, 
they come to realize that this divine knowledge of God's nature, like the law, has given them their Lord in such a close and intimate sense that all doubt in asserting their good is gone. The definition of obey is to submit to authority or to follow rules or directives. Therefore, whether it is mechanical, literal, or spiritual, all movement is governed by obedience. A massive machine without a governor would disobey its own laws of motion or gravity and be destroyed entirely. An intellectual giant who disregards the rules of learning will regress to becoming an idiot. A pupil who disobeys or disregards the spirit's guidance or God's law will turn good into evil. Our success or failure in this life is solely dependent on our level of obedience. It sustains our society, towns, states, and countries. Our homes, as well as our lives, depend on it. We appreciate compliance, and generally, we are in favor of it. But woe to him who seeks to enter by robbing for personal gain. If we go inside the home, we can see how the mother's strict parenting methods shape the child. We'll meet a mother tomorrow who is ecstatic that her son has developed into a man and achieved success. Success because he cultivated respect, obedience, and unselfish thinking after sowing the obedience seed early in his life. On the other hand, we can see how others fall short since they encouraged his development by acting disrespectfully, disobediently, and selfishly. The company's success depends on its members abiding by the rules of commerce, which are its cornerstone. Only when man extends these laws to include speculation, inflated values, or a lack of cooperation, can he bring about errors, failures, and losses for himself. Our adherence to the law of thought and its creator, God, is the root of all of our troubles in life. Knowing what to obey and what to disobey is where we struggle. The solution is found in nature. There are no issues that it cannot solve. It doesn't have any issues that can't be fixed. It cannot bear any burdens, and it can do any task. Why? The tremendous law of harmony and order, which perpetually eliminates all disharmony, heals all illnesses, straightens what is crooked and meets all wants, governs all operations. A new sprout that tries to emerge from the ground early in the winter is destroyed by Mother Nature, who drives it out and freezes it. However, the same amount of snow and ice that freezes the rambunctious tiny sprout also provides warmth and safety to other seedlings that follow her rules. Man needs to understand how to respect nature's laws if he wants to use nature for his labor, such as farming or gardening. He receives the best outcomes from the laws when he follows them, and in the end, he will reap the biggest rewards. Whoever abides by nature's laws and serves it as its submissive servant eventually rises to the position of master and reaps a bountiful crop. Every student who upholds the law and is a sincere servant of goodness will grow spiritually and be given the ability to influence every aspect of his life, as well as earn many benefits. The master was trying to convey this to us when he said, Let he who is greatest among you be your servant. Whoever rises up will be brought low. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But Paul adds, When I am weak, I am strong, which obviously indicates that when he is weak because he upholds the law of good, he is strong and tenacious. As a result, we are not left with the impression that he is a weak person who easily yields to the stronger or is easily pushed aside by the more aggressive. Our mistakes are largely attributable to the fact that we have more readily followed earthly laws than spiritual laws. The law encourages us to base our beliefs on the inner realities rather than the outward appearances of things. We must obey God rather than man. Peter and the apostles said to the people gathered around them in the marketplace, Instead of following the law of man, we must follow the law of good. They understood that no matter whether a person follows the guidance of the Spirit, or the desires of his or her senses, his or her actions will have the effects for which he or she intended. The Apostle Paul writes, Know that you must obey not the one whose servant you are, for you are only the servants of the one whom you want to obey, whether from sin unto death or from obedience unto righteousness. The law demands that we consider what is within us before we perceive what is outside of us if we desire to obey the Spirit within us rather than the circumstances in which we live. 
The majority of our experiences are the result of what our actions have caused. These actions are carried out prior to becoming constrained by our mental thoughts. As you have sown, so shall you reap, is a mathematically sound and reliable proverb. The natural world does not yield potatoes when you sow a turnip seed. Nature doesn't err and grow a huge oak tree when you sow a corn seed. The law will comply and give you something to worry about if you have anxiety-inducing ideas, according to the same logic. It will continue to create new situations that will make you worry more. You will get what you are waiting for if you ponder about illness and hardship. Obey the law no matter what. Consequently, knowing what to obey is crucial. Laugh at minor issues so that you may see them for what they are. For the young child, his small task appears serious and significant, and until he becomes too old, he won't look back on his immature behavior with remorse. We can never expect to stop experiencing problems and challenges if we are unable to find solutions to them. One night after putting her child to sleep, a mother noticed that he wasn't sleeping well. He gave her a call and requested that she turn on the light. The mother went to his room when she sensed something was off and talked to him till he trusted her. He discovered that the other kids had threatened to bring the big bad wolf to him, since he had not given them his toy earlier in the day. Later the mother clarified that there was no bad wolf. According to her, the idea was to frighten him into giving up his toy. She assured him that there was no actual dangerous wolf and that he could rest. The mother recognized the truth but the youngster followed the illusion of events and became alarmed. The reality could become a source of anxiety as he grew older, so after removing it from his mind, she gave her son permission to fall asleep calmly. The purpose of our lesson is to learn how we can correctly choose and serve the law for our highest good. We can serve principles or things in everything we think and do. Things are the events or results of invisible causes. Considering that principle is the true cause, and it is spirit. The principle is what we think in our minds, and things are the results of those thoughts. A man who obeys illusions or worships things will have burdens to bear. A man's burdens are the things he claims as his personal property. The things he feels are his own, and consequently he must protect and serve them. Years ago, a relative of mine loved illusions and things. He strived to accumulate wealth. He worked so hard earning his wealth that he lost his health. Then he turned around and tried to gain his health by spending his wealth, and in the end he died, disappointed and disillusioned. That man, like so many others, had started life with the wrong conception of God's law. Strange, but man does not possess an earthly thing. Everything he has has been lent to him according to his understanding of the law he serves. Man is born naked and dies in that nakedness. All his earthly things are taken away from him. Even the many burdens become illusions again. His real task in life is to find his place according to his understanding, and the understanding that determines how he lives life. Analyze your burdens. They arise from some ideas of ownership that you think. You may have dependents, others who have to be provided for, and you feel you have to take care of them because they have no other protection or provider. But when you realize the whole that is in God, you will change your idea of responsibility. Then your mental communique will allow more good to flow to you, and it will come to you in many more ways than before. Thousands today are held in bondage to the idea that they must be helped by others, that they must have relief. Their greatest need is not your help or mine as much as it is a new understanding of life itself. Fear of the future has become a belief that affects all ages. When you abide by the law of fear instead of the law of God, you will have many more burdens. Only when we are able to throw our burdens on the law will we be free. If you are obedient to the law, you will not suffer from these burdens. You will be able to live in the present, do your duty better and better every day. Forget the past and let the future take care of you. To trust the law, it is necessary to know its guidance from experience and practice. For those who have not learned this guidance, experience must be gained. God does not require us to follow his leader on the basis of blind trust. Here is evidence of an invisible intelligence that pervades everything 
even your mind and body. Disobedience to the law is the refusal to do what we know is right. We all know it is right, but we don't always do it, because it seems to interfere with or delay our immediate attainment of the object we see. We want it back fast, forgetting that the law moves slowly, but works perfectly and well. We want instant healing from our illnesses, but we are reluctant to give up the habits that cause them. When we speak of a man of principle, we mean a man who is disciplined by the right to think and live well. A man who is not easily swayed. A man who is not an opportunist. A man who does not deviate from the path of what he believes to be right for personal profit or popular acclaim. A man, in short, who can be trusted because he is absolutely true to his convictions, regardless of temptations to change or modify them. No one will deny that such a man inspires the utmost confidence and can become a point of strength and leadership. He is the one whom others rely on for leadership, while the man who is easily persuaded to give in to pressure, even for futile reasons, is not the kind of person we can count on. If this is true for man in the outer realm, how much more true it is for man in the inner realm, the mental realm, because God is principle not, just governed by principle. Man governed by God never questions the results that can be obtained by following the principle line, because the principle is based on law and obedience. So this law can only have one result, happiness, peace, and prosperity. All we need is to learn obedience to the law of truth and not obey the petty things that constantly arise when we allow our visions to be disturbed and harassed. Blessed are those who hear God's word and keep it. Listen to my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. When we obey the voice, law, then we understand the Master's statement. All that is mine is yours. This is the law acting through us. When we obey the law, we humble our personal self to the divine self within us. We refuse to accept the outward appearances of things as final and true, but turn inward and seek that which is real and true as God, the law, is meant to be. We live with God in His work, not after death, not tomorrow or next year, but right here and now. God's kingdom is all about us, waiting for our recognition or obedience to His law. We must be able to converse and live with God, the law, in our daily lives. Then we will live with love and joy, hope and wealth and peace here and everywhere. It is ours, for so it is determined. Law of Success God would want everyone to be successful. God intends for man to rise to greatness. God intends for man to not just use, but also enjoy all that is excellent in the cosmos. Nothing is forbidden by God's law for humans. Man was made to be wealthy. He possesses limitless intrinsic abilities. Every typical individual is born with a full complement of talents that, when properly developed and scientifically utilized, will guarantee success with a constant upward trend. Man is designed to advance. Every man has the potential for unending growth within himself. The main goal of the law is progress in everything. Man can build himself with ever-increasing success by learning to cooperate with the law in achieving that aim. Nature's procedures all work out successfully. Failures are unknown in nature. It has never made an unsuccessful prediction. It seeks outcomes in all shapes and forms. If we want to succeed in the finest and most comprehensive sense, we must imitate nature and her processes. We will find all the keys to success in its ideas and rules. The resources available to man are limitless. His opportunities have no boundaries. He focuses on and recognizes the components, forces, and universal principles. He can grow to be incredibly intelligent, which will enable him to find answers to all of life's mysteries, learn all of nature's secrets, and resolve all of humanity's issues. There are no obstacles. Everyone possesses dormant higher abilities, incredible talent, superior intuition, and greater strength, which can be developed to an exceptional degree for use in successful and practical ways through the employment of particular psychological techniques. Greatness can be developed in any mentality. It only takes knowing how to do it. Each person will grow through genuine self-help, self-discovery, self-knowledge, and appropriate teaching in using one's faculties and strengths. Efficiency will be ensured by practice, 
and results will come from use. Therefore, every aspiring individual can achieve success. Do you aspire to success? You may. You already have everything you need within of you. All you need to do is develop a thorough understanding of the laws and principles that success is built upon, and then employ the appropriate methods for pursuing those causes until success is attained. The laws of every science are considered to be the law of success. Every time this law is used correctly, results will be obtained. These are the results that matter, and since this law can be consistently applied to multiply results forever, there is no limit to the degree of success that can be attained. Little things and huge things both have a chance to happen, and those who employ the law in good faith and with understanding will be rewarded with the big things. There is a better state or condition and a better future in store for you, but you must get ready for it. If you do nothing, you will never reach the greater and better things. All that is required is research, preparation, and work. Both young and old have an equal right to advancement. Simply moving forward is the only way to be true to yourself and the law that governs you. The law was designed to help you advance. You can stop moving forward or go backward to postpone your usual advancement for a while or even longer, but eventually you will be compelled to move forward, especially in the direction of soul development. Nature doesn't interfere with your goals. This explains why failing to advance typically results in a lot of hardship. You can achieve your goal because there is a new force outside, the spirit of progress, and we all need to stay up with it. Aim high and construct well. You can succeed in whichever way you define it. The law is perfect. It has the power to actualize ideals. It also has the ability to materialize whatever mental picture you may have. Always strive to construct in accordance with your ability and success. It develops its strategy for you. All successful great persons have the same faculties that you do as a human being. They developed a certain correct knowledge, used their abilities to advance in the best way they knew how, and thus they were entitled to success. But where does true success lie? Some people may inquire. Almost everyone else will have a unique perspective on what actual success looks like. Let's clarify the term's definition to avoid any misunderstandings. Most people define success as a high level of material prosperity. Others see it as the accomplishment of personal goals or heartfelt wishes. Still others see it as the achievement of lofty aspirations or remarkable deeds. But true success goes beyond this. We do not define it in terms of money, status, fame, or riches, though all of these things might be part of it. True, genuine, and higher success can be found in accomplishments that are gathered and shared for the benefit of all people and the enlightenment of the world. Long-term success, however, will be construed for the sake of our lecture in a more personal meaning, in the sense of personal growth and advancement, and the superfluous pursuit of nothing favorable. Man is designed to use the components of his life to elevate himself to ever greater strength, development, and success. In order to achieve this goal, he is likewise discreetly tied to everything outside of himself. But whether he actually uses his intellect to dominate it with knowledge of the forces in his life, or to serve it with ignorance, will depend on how he actually uses it. Success elevates your behaviors and ego above those of a regular person. The majority of life's setbacks and setbacks are what lead to mental blindness. The intellect thinks appropriately when the heart is in the right place. From the heart come the problems of life. All our deeds are judged by our inner motives, not by our outward successes. Millions of people's dreams have been dashed by moral cowardice, hesitation at crucial times, the urge to go one's own way, and an inability to work together. Their chances of success have been completely wrecked. The first step for anyone who wants to achieve greatness is to get rid of these mental disabilities. Applying a true strategy and validating what is good in mind and deed are necessary for success. It is more crucial to uphold a principle. As long as the golden rule is the cornerstone of any economic activity that can be in accordance with the principle, success is not something that is temporary, a game of chance, or the result of luck. Business and religion are a single science, not two distinct ones. 
According to Lord Leverhulme, the Sermon on the Mount cannot serve as the foundation for conducting modern business. I can only assert that any other system will never ensure the success of a firm. The expression of man's highest ideal, or religion, is business. Even if a man is honest, sincere, and hardworking, it does not guarantee his success. Additionally, a man's growth will be slowed down by fear if he is timid, hesitant, or afraid. Even if a man is an effective engineer, an inferiority mentality will make him mediocre and prevent him from developing to the full extent of his abilities and training. The majority of errors are brought on by fear, which cannot be treated with medication or a surgeon's scalpel. Fear has no recognized cure. Comprehension does. There is nothing to fear if one realizes that God's presence permeates the entire cosmos. If it weren't for a fear of some sort that tells us otherwise, the majority of us could fulfill our duties. Despite the notion that we lack the capability to do so, we mesmerize ourselves. Fear blurs our vision, dulls our senses, and paralyzes the mental resources we need to be free and active in order to prevent disasters. Fear can make a man's thoughts muddled, which makes him ready to seize an opportunity. God gives us a spirit of courage and wise judgment, rather than fear. Religion does not make a man successful. Guy gains more from life with a religion that serves to extend his perspective, just as a guy benefits from spectacles to better his vision. While the irreligious practical man has a narrow and constrained view, true religion assists to broaden or widen man's vision. If we believe that individuals and or material circumstances control resources and worry when they don't, the situation will only become worse. The only defense is a consistent affirmation that God the law is our source of supply. If we know that God the law is on our side, we may do this more readily. If we want success, we must think about success, speak and behave successfully. The law does not withhold any beneficial thing from people who walk uprightly. The pious guy understands that it is better to be on our side than to be against us. It is said that we pull our horses and restrain them just as they are about to jump the barricade, which leads to around half of our failures. Good riders encourage their horses to utilize their judgment, which results in a safe jump. The reason for half of our failures is that we pull when we ought to be jumping while leaving all of our strength behind. When we should be riding to victory, we are the ones who drag ourselves down. One day, two guys dove into the river and gave each other a two-mile swim challenge. The swimmer continued swimming to the other shore with strength and steadiness without turning around. He finished his swim and looked back to see his pal not even close when he emerged on the river bank. He was once more on the bank where they had started, when he took a closer look, and, lo and behold, he asked his companion, How come you didn't follow me across the river and reach the other bank? When they finally ran into each other. The young man who had turned around explained, Oh, after I got about halfway, I looked back and saw how far I had gone and was afraid I couldn't make it, so I went back. But why didn't you consider gazing ahead like I did? I just noticed the shore getting closer to me with each stroke, the boy who had swum down the river said. Why didn't you imagine that swimming forward would be just as difficult as turning around? The Red Sea appeared to be an impassable barrier as Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. Many murmured and bemoaned the fact that they had ever left Egypt, while some want to turn around. God, what shall I do? wailed Moses. And the reply was, Why do you call out to me? Talk to your sons so they can leave. When Moses addressed his followers, the rivers divided as they marched toward the sea, allowing them to cross over the dry land. Moses prevented retreat by burning the bridges behind him as he went. Success comes from moving up in rank. No guy can achieve success without the proper training. For a competition that may only last a few minutes, an athlete will practice for weeks or even months. The key to success is in going forward, and the mindset that encourages this continuous advancement is the key element in the art of success. No one can succeed if they don't have the desire to do it in the first place. Actually, the first stage is to thoroughly fill oneself with the spirit of advancement, so that one is constantly motivated to work toward higher and more significant goals.
Advancement-driven desire suggests power. This is the one law of science that is unbreakable in its acts. The fact that you want to achieve is evidence that you have the ability to succeed. If you lacked the ability to succeed, you would not have been encouraged to pursue success. If you lack the ability to succeed, you cannot desire to do so. Power is created by desire. Power inspires a person's thinking, and success is the result of that inspiration when it is used properly. Investigating the lives of successful men reveals a startling fact. They all share a mentality that is productive, and this mentality is what makes them successful. This positive frame of mind is referred to by psychologists as having a successful attitude. As straightforward as it may sound, the dominating mental attitude is also what determines whether anything succeeds or fails. It is the error and the root of the failure. This astonishing fact was uncovered by modern psychology, and it offers a solution to some serious issues as well as a path through hardship and failure. In other words, the only real difference between those who succeed and those who fail is one man's positive mental attitude that he can, as opposed to another man's negative mental attitude that he cannot. When one learns the truth and realizes they have the ability to act, their energies are liberated, channeled into action, elevated with the desire to succeed, and inspired to act. However, some people are of the mindset that they must stay the way they are. The little aptitude or authority they do have, in their opinion, is all they can hope or seek in this life because they have been cast by God in a definite mold. The intricacies of the human mind are being studied scientifically, and it opens up a fascinating world of power and potential. What is conceivable for one mind is feasible for another, and far more than we ever imagined, according to psychological fact. All brains are capable of the same human faculties and powers that grandeur and achievement have fostered. The only true distinction is not in gender, but in the level of development. Start developing a better perspective of yourself, your life and situations, as well as of things and people in general, right now. You will do something bigger and better as you mentally envision it, both consciously and unconsciously. In other words, as you progress, the spirit of progress will progressively permeate your thoughts, desires, words, and mental activities. At the same time, your capacities and abilities will strengthen. The secret to having a successful mindset is to embody the icon mentality. Recognize your potential for achievement and then act, think, and live accordingly. You can search all over the place for the enigmatic key to success, but ultimately it can be found in these two simple words. I can. According to contemporary psychology, the power of empowerment grows swiftly in those who believe they can. This can be proven to be a law of the mind. Continue to believe that you can accomplish your goals, and you'll soon discover that you're carrying them out. This is how the law operates. There is no miracle about it. The underlying idea is that if the mindset of I can is adopted, the mind will go on to focus all of its energies on the faculties that are used to carry out your goals and will gradually develop them until they are large and powerful enough to carry out what previously seemed impossible. The imposing Alps presented Napoleon with a challenge that seemed insurmountable when he attempted to conquer Italy. Napoleon did not think, I cannot despite the fact that the people who lived nearby believed them to be completely impassable. He repeatedly told himself, I can, because he was determined to succeed. The folks on the other side of the mountain were so shocked by his descent that he was essentially overpowered without any resistance. The shock of accomplishing the seemingly unthinkable sapped the will to resist it. Thus, his biggest challenge turned out to be a definite way to win. And so it is with all challenges. Obstacles are usually stepping stones to success because they are seen from a higher perspective. After being imprisoned, John Bunyan encountered a challenge comparable to the Alps. He wished to carry on with his spiritual endeavors. He was not easily deterred, so he inscribed his epic, The Pilgrim's Progress, on the crumpled paper that had served as the milk jug's cork. More people were reached by this book alone than he could have ever preached to in his entire life. Obstacles provide us a chance to use our innate abilities. They bring them out, 
fortify us, and direct us toward the desired outcome. Say these words to yourself when you are faced with it and you want to move forward. I can. Keep in mind that those three phrases are the key to all achievement, and that no good goal has ever been realized without realizing them. Mental attitude plays a significant role in determining the quality of life. Men project a sense of disappointment, sadness, and failure because they embrace the I can't mentality. Others successfully exude success with a self assured, vivacious, and upbeat attitude of I can. They appear everywhere we go. One person experiences hardship, misery, and misfortune, while the other attracts the best people and succeeds. Because it is in line with the divine order of things, the law forbids us from using the weak negative, the singular, I can't, because it repels us and we automatically avoid it. On the other side, we are drawn to him by his strong sense of self and I can attitude. He seems upbeat, therefore we are pleased to approach him and work with him. Like a flower has its own perfume, each person has their own unique atmosphere. We therefore work to develop a strong sense of I can, which will lead to success. You are always better than things or circumstances, if not actually, then theoretically. Whatever you set your sights on, make sure you succeed. Set high standards for yourself and your goals, and you'll make fewer mistakes overall. Keep a I can mentality and remind yourself of it frequently. You'll be successful. Victory is in your future. The man who starts out with the intention of being wealthy will not succeed, according to John D. Rockefeller. He must be quite ambitious. The secret to commercial success is not a mystery. Everything will work out well if you carry out your responsibilities successfully each day, adhere faithfully to company law's natural operations, and maintain your composure. Understanding your life or stating your ideal or aim is the next step. Create a mental image of what you want to achieve and keep that in mind. Start by making a consistent effort to progress toward the end result. After all, life is a sequence of many steps. Each step may present new challenges, but whenever you do, always keep looking up toward your aim, your objective, and your goal. No matter how amateurish or unsuccessful your initial attempts may be, they are only the start. Everyone has to start somewhere, therefore there is no point in comparing yourself to someone else. You are aware that you won't fail until you give up. The only way to fail is to give up. Continue trying. Every attempt yields some outcome. Success is only a culmination of numerous positive outcomes, after all. Never put off until tomorrow what you can do today, advised Benjamin Franklin. The worst foe you will face in life is the one within your head. Procrastination is the name of it. Ambition is killed by procrastination. Indecision is a bad habit that will lead to failure. Make judgments that are clear and prompt. Respond to the tiny inquiries that come your way, and all future big inquiries will be handled for you. One who is unable to make decisions for themselves obviously subordinates their judgment, being open to the racial thinking of those around them, becoming one of the masses, and only attracting what the masses find attractive. What do you like to do in your spare time? What do you do with it? What do you do with it? Do you place any value on it? These days, the utilization of gadgets, or so-called byproducts, determines a lot of profit and occasionally the entire success. Although byproducts are distinct from the primary product, they nonetheless have worth. Every large company has its own byproducts, or gadgets, that are profitable. All of Armour Meat Packaging Company's byproducts are beneficial. Numerous byproducts include hair and braids. The hair is used to make thick rope and brushes, and the braids are dried and marketed as sort of a delicacy. Now, the amount of dividends paid to shareholders by Armour would alter significantly if it didn't employ byproducts. We need to understand that we cannot produce goods like Armour Meat Packing Company. We are retailers in the long run. Success depends on how we use the time we have and all of its odd moments, as we like to refer to them. What about those peculiar times? Real success can sometimes start in unexpected circumstances. What you do with your leisure time 
not only boosts your brain activity, but also brings about evident financial gain. By using it wisely and profitably, you can extend your life and increase your chances of success. Each lost minute is a forgotten byproduct. Once lost, something is lost forever. Consider the 20 minutes on the trolley, the 20 minutes spent waiting for appointments throughout the day, the quarter hour before breakfast, the half hour after, and the dozens of other opportunities each day when you may be reading, drawing, concentrating, or working toward your objective. Spend all of your time productively. Only people who lack direction, value, and success discuss passing the time. While the one who is achieving makes his time alive and valuable, the person who is wasting time is destroying his opportunities. There is never enough time in the day for him, and I always like hearing that. I dare say the individual is succeeding and making the most of his life. The key to success, then, is how we develop the ability to employ two important resources, our time and our thinking. Success is determined by how we apply our knowledge, not by knowledge itself. Always keep in mind that the Father's arms are there to guide, guard, and support us in spite of all our labor and struggle, beneath the smoke and dust of things. Whatever you lack, He will provide for you. Whatever you need, He can provide for you. And whatever challenges you face, you can overcome them with God at your side. When duty whispers, you must, the young man responds. I can, Emerson wrote. This recording of Universal Laws, Unlocking the Secrets of the Universe for an Abundant Life, by David J. Davidson, was presented by Stargate Book. Sound recording copyright 2023 and produced by Deep Send Limited 2023.